All right, welcome to Chessum Guy's podcast. I'm Chessum Guy. I am here with my very special guest, my best friend in the entire world. <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't even know the guy. But he has an awesome, awesome book that we're going to talk about here today. And he also has a very awesome website called Jay's Analysis. Uh, dot com. He has written two books. One we're going to talk about, Esoteric Hollywood and Esoteric Hollywood 2. He's done a show called Hollywood Decoded on Gaia TV, if I got that correct. Um, and so thank you very much for taking your time to speak with Loli Um And uh, yeah, uh, is there anything that I missed? I don't think so. Uh, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. The only thing I can think of is that I, I do have a uh, subscription service at Jay's Analysis. So if people are interested, they can subscribe there. Um, but glad to be here. Glad to talk to you. Glad you enjoyed the book. And hopefully, uh, Esther Hollywood 2 can, can live up to the expectations. So far, everybody seems to think part two actually tops part one. So uh, I know you're busy with part one. You haven't got to part two yet, but that's okay. You, you will you. in time. Yes. So thank you for having me. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, well, I guess one of the main theses um, of your book and of your writing about Hollywood is the connection of Hollywood with CIA, with the occult, with even the mafia, as you cover in, right. in your second book. Right. Um, so can you expand a little bit what really got you focused on that? How did you start to figure that out? Well, I just always loved movies. I grew up as a uh, guy who wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be in movies. I thought that sounded fun. I know that's typical in America. Everybody kind of wants to have this Hollywood-style dream that they have, and you think it's going to be this and that. And then as you get older, you kind of get wiser to the way the world really works, that it doesn't actually operate like a movie, and people aren't always cast because they're the most talented or they're the best at what they do or this or that. Um, but I was very active in uh, drama team in um, comedy duos back in high school. We used to, that was an aspect of the drama team where you could do comedy duo and improv. So I had a lot of fun doing that. And, and my crew in high school, we were all very artsy. So we were the artsy kind of people. And, um, you know, we were always making skits and making videos and, and <laughs> doing the stuff that I do now, basically. So it kind of naturally led into when I went to college, I wanted to, to pick something relevant to that. I wasn't as interested in acting as I did kind of turn my attention toward philosophy. Um, and, and when you're going through college, you're kind of thinking, well, how can I um, pick something that's going to make money that's also going to be fun at the same time? Uh, and I failed at that. I picked something that does not make money, but is fun. <laughs> so, uh, I had to figure out a way to make money after I did all that college nonsense. And I don't recommend people go to university unless you're going for a hard science. Then I say it could be potentially useful, but long story short in college, I got into geopolitics and conspiracy and this kind of stuff in the real world. And I started reading really in-depth historical books. I did a, a undergraduate uh, in history and philosophy and then a graduate in uh, philosophy and literature. And I wanted a way to really tie all of those worlds together. I, I'm a big picture, holistic thinker kind of person. So I wanted to see the interrelationships between these seemingly disparate worlds. And eventually... I, I, by the time I got to grad school, I was really focused on, I had had a, some several film classes that were really cool. We analyzed a lot of Oliver Stone films. We did a lot of uh, lit and um, movies. Film and lit was one of my favorite classes. So it just kind of became its own natural transition. I just kind of went from taking the academic interests and trying to meld them with the artsy movie interests. And this is what came out. Hmm. I um, currently am reading uh, Lily Kay's book, Molecular Vision of Life. Mm -hmm. And she actually says, she's got this chapter about how in the 20s they were building up Caltech LA. Mm -hmm. She actually has this little uh, paragraph where she talks about, you know, she says Southern California burst into the national arena during the 1920s and its indigenous industries. Um, derive their might from the region's own business magnates. She says, with the exception of the motion picture industry financed heavily by the Rockefeller mm -hmm. and J.P. Morgan groups. 
this yes. is such a big support of your thesis that Hollywood is not, I guess you would say, organic. That it's, uh, I guess it's there for a reason, right? Not just entertainment. Ultimately, yes. Right. And, and this is kind of what I touched on early on in the first book was that even before the big studio systems, it was kind of seen and known back in the 20s, the teens, 20s, that there was going to be the potential for social engineering with the camera. Mm -hmm. um, I actually go into a little more of this in the second book where I talk about the character of Howard Hughes, his history, his relationship between what nowadays we'd call the deep state and ho <clears throat> Hollywood and him actually making really elaborate uh, war propaganda films that were the blockbusters of their day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Hell's Angels is one of the great blockbusters and he put all of his own money into making this big, this big blockbuster. So what we see from that and from many other examples, um, like you said, Rockefeller's, uh, they particularly were were involved in RKO pictures, mm -hmm. um, and then other there were other studios that eventually developed, and you had different mafias that you had the the Italian mafia, you had the Jewish mafia, you had the Wasp mafia. These different mafias all had interest in these different studios, so it becomes a a, a multi layered uh, engine of propaganda. And ultimately, yes, I think if you wanted to subsume it under one big umbrella, what we eventually see, especially by the time of the 50s, 40s and 50s with Laurel Canyon Studio, is that the chief utilizer of Hollywood as a propaganda edifice is the Pentagon. It is the Air Force. It is the military, especially during those wartime periods. I mean, it's just churning out nonstop wartime propaganda and and it's natural to i mean that that's the soviets themselves did this right there were a lot of soviet filmmakers who also churned out propaganda through film and that's just the nature of the beast it's just the nature of the camera and what they saw it could do um and so i'm not trying to oversimplify it by saying that mm -hmm. it was one giant conspiracy there were multiple competing interests and powers but ultimately that's really what it becomes useful for is is military and social engineering propaganda right and within the within the blockbusters i'm saying within right the yeah yeah that's yeah that's what we're going to get into when we start talking about these movies that you break down um and your research you've shown that the the rockefeller uh interest the foundation was uh mimosa his his staff eventually made up the original oss right mm -hmm. the oss the predecessor to the tia was staffed with a bunch of guys that were mm -hmm. working in, in, in Rockefeller anyways. So there you immediately have that marriage of Hollywood, the uh, intelligence agencies under the same roof of the Rockefeller organs. Mm -hmm. So again, your thesis is heavily supported. Um, and yeah. I, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say real quick, the, the, the best example of this that's even clear, I'm not saying that your examples aren't clear. I mean, you know, you mm -hmm. see it with Howard Hughes and then later on with, with guys that are uh, a little more obviously OSS for sure, um, and all of the original big TV studios, CBS, NBC, CBS, uh, they were also originally staffed by people from the OSS. So they they took all their wartime uh, mm -hmm. psychological warfare research, and they combined it with Walter Lippmann and PR stuff, and then that then they went into film and TV, and that's how they were so successful in mm -hmm. marshalling uh, public opinion during those decades for the wars. And then eventually for the Cold War. But the only thing I wanted to say was that the other great example of this and the, and the, the way that I kind of inadvertently stumbled on this was through just an interest in movies and then doing my grad work on the character of Ian Fleming, who's the, right. the you know guy behind James Bond. And that's probably the best, clearest example of the relationship between intelligence agencies and Hollywood is just the character of Ian Fleming himself because he was a high-level black ops guy. Sorry if you can hear that. <laughs> Someone's stomping around upstairs. Um, yes. I hear it. The boomers do it here. I do it all the time, too. <laughs> so, um, also, when I was reading Rene Wormser's Foundation and Their Powers, um, mm -hmm. he, he actually said the infamous Alder Hiss, while he was the president of the Carnegie Foundation, actually suggested using movies to educate the public on world affairs. Sure. So again, and I think I tweeted at you about that, like, did you ever find you know, direct involvement of the foundations other than through the CIA in funding movies uh, with specific propaganda? And I think you kind of already answered that question there. 
there are, uh, it becomes more pronounced later on, but uh, I would say during the wartime period, uh, it was less pronounced through the foundations. So, like, um, you know, I typically point to examples like uh, if you look at the old Twilight Zone, you'll mm-hmm. find that a lot of the consultation that was going on with Twilight Zone was through Department of Defense. And it actually be in the credits of a lot of the, the episodes of Twilight Zone. Not everyone, but a lot of the military ones, really heavily military. You'll see a made in consultation with the Department of Defense. Um, so it was actually during the wartime periods, ironically, it was a little more transparent that it was being used for military purposes. Now there were people that were experimenting even back then with product placement, but it's actually by the time of bond is when product placement really becomes fashionable and successful as an experiment with Mm -hmm. James Bond promoting you know, different vodkas and, and Aston Martins and Walter PK guns and this kind of stuff. Yeah. And there's actually interviews with Sean Connery back then talking about, you know, this, this really kicking off uh, product placement in a, in a successful way. But with foundations themselves, um, you're right that there have been, old, there, there have been interconnectedness, but I, I'm, I would say that it's, it's a little more transparent as we get closer into the cold war. Uh, because the role of NGOs and foundations, even though there have always been these private foundations for a long time, um, they take on more prominence as we move to after World War II. Mm-hmm. Right, let's, let's start getting into the, the book here. Um, mm-hmm. The first part, you cover a lot of Kubrick, um, mm-hmm. you know, Eyes Wide Shut, The Shining 2001. Part two is my favorite part. You really start taking down H.G. Wells, and then you get into Spielberg with uh, E.T., Close Encounters, mm-hmm. A.I., uh, Minority Report. Um, part three is your 70s and 80s dystopia movies. Um, part four is when you really get into 007. And, mm-hmm. and then you have your conclusion. Altogether, you get 24 chapters. A lot of movies. We're not going to cover every single one of them because mm-hmm. we don't have all night. Um, but I'll, I'm going to kind of go in chronological order. Get one, okay. sometimes two questions per of the movies. Cool. Um, but your very first chapter is, is what you call the occult empire. And it sort of is the history of the occult and theater, even going back to Shakespeare. Right. Um, you, would you say that Hollywood, you know, movies, theater in general, is not just about creating uh, crude propaganda, but is also bringing people into sort of an occult ritual and getting them sort of conditioned and maybe, as they say, like opening a portal to their mind. Do you think that's mm-hmm. kind of what the movies do, the theater does? For, for many, yes. Uh, there are many people that would take it that seriously. Um, in fact, there's just a, a funny interview that popped up pretty, it's an old interview from like 10 years ago, but it just popped up recently on YouTube that I saw and you can look it up. It's If you look up Nicholas, C- I know it sounds funny, but look up Nicholas Cage's interview about Ghost Rider and what he calls his neo-shamanic technique of acting. <laughs> now, this sounds really funny, and it is funny, but at the same time, there's an element of seriousness to it because what Nick Cage says is that he views the, the actor like a shaman and that the role of the, the actor is to literally be, in a sense, possessed by the spirit of who he's trying to be. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't believe that in every case an actor is possessed. I'm not saying that. Uh, acting is not inherently occulted but there are traditions of acting like the stanislavski method where the goal is implicitly to have your persona move into the background and have the alter persona come to the to the fore that's the whole they even have like breathing exercises very elaborate approaches to how you're supposed to try to do this in the stanislavski method and nick cage was very open that in his worldview he sees it as a very shamanic kind of journey that the actor's trying to be like this voodoo priest guy Mm. and i think i don't think he's totally making a joke and he's being serious and i i wish that i had seen that interview years ago because i would have put that in my in my book because it's exactly what my first chapter is about so what i would say is that for some of the actors who do have esoteric worldviews or occultic worldviews um they would see it that way but i'm not saying that every hollywood movie is that or that every director and producer and actor views it the way they don't um but there are pretty clear examples of directors producers um actors 
who explicitly speak this way in many, right. many cases. Um, you've got uh, somebody like Darren Aronofsky. I mean, he very, he very consciously uses Kabbalistic imagery in his movies. You've got Kubrick, obviously, using esoteric themes in his movies. David Lynch is pretty open about the influence of uh, Tibetan Buddhist type themes in his, in his films. So, um, for certain directors, I would say yes. That transition right perfectly into chapter two, which is your analysis of Eyes Wide Shut. And by and, the way, uh, if you if you're not familiar, there's the famous book by Crowley and occultist Kenneth Anger, Hollywood mm -hmm. Babylon, and my first chapter was kind of piggybacking off of that. I mean, it's not at all the same as Kenneth Anger's book. His book is like a scandal book of scandalous mm -hmm. 20s and 30s actors. Mm -hmm. um, but it is kind of piggybacking off that idea of, mm -hmm. of Hollywood Babylon. Right. Um, in, in Eyes Wide Shut, mm -hmm. on page 27, mm -hmm. kind of what we were just talking about, you do say that... Um, it functions as an initiation mirroring the desire of the individual to pass judgment mm -hmm. on the taboos contained in the film while simultaneously attending its showing. Mm -hmm. One is, in a sense, participating in the ritual, even if from afar, through the magic of the screen. Right. And later on, later on that, on page 47, you say, you know, because a lot of this is about, you know, uh, sex rituals of right. the elite and so right. on and so forth. So obviously a lot of this analysis deals with the occult factors of sex rituals and so on and so forth. Right. But you say that the power structure is not merely focused on wealth and temporal power, but particularly ritualized worldview that seeks to use sex drive mm -hmm. as a force for metaphysical power. Power right. over this drive allows power over the masses. Mm -hmm. So the idea of I guess you would say weaponizing sex as yeah. a way to control and manipulate people. That you, you it is sort of heavily represented in this movie, right? Absolutely. I think, yeah, there's no question. Yes. Because you, I, I guess in your analysis, you say um, it seems like they were setting up Tom Cruise's character the whole mm -hmm. time. Like, he kept running into people. These weren't accidents. They were setting him up the right. whole time. Yeah, I, I would say that... Um, even if you don't agree with the sort of ritualistic occult view, uh, my reading of this movie, that's, that's how I read it. I don't think many scholars would, or film critics would deny the Freudian element of, yeah. um, sexual repression and manipulation that's going on. I'm not saying I believe that. I'm saying that mm -hmm. that's what I think Kubrick has in mind. There's undoubtedly a Freudian side to this movie. Um, but, but I think there are, <clears throat> That's the kind of normie analysis that most film critics would give the movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's Freudian and it's sexual <laughs> repression and marriage. And yeah, I, I'm going beyond that, and I'm saying that I think I think Kubrick has a consistent pattern in his canon of films, where he's also critiquing the elite. He's mm -hmm. showing the the worldview of the elite that mm -hmm. it's very different from you and I, and that's why Bill Harford represents kind of the highest level of the middle class. Like that's mm -hmm. as high as the typical successful middle class guy could get as a you know well paid New York doctor. And then he stumbles into this world that is is people infinitely more wealthy than him mm -hmm. who live a completely different way. Their day to day is completely different. And their worldview is very different. They yeah. they have the time, just just the leisure time to be able to spend your your days studying esoteric philosophies. I mean if you're a working class dude, you ha don't have the time to do that. Yeah. But he's interacting then stepping into this world of billionaires and multimillionaires, zillionaires, and they're more interested in these kinds of eccentric things. Mm -hmm. And we know now, especially even after I wrote, I mean, I knew it well from the time that I wrote this book because I had read about conspiracy for so many years. But even since my book came out in the last two years, we've seen large scale Hollywood sex cults like Nexium be mm -hmm. exposed full of fabulously wealthy people a direct confirmation of my analysis of the book right. or of the movie. Yeah. How, I mean, I think Kubrick had to know something. How well, how deep do you think he was? You know, how well do you think he knew? Oh, I think he knew everything that was going yeah. on. I mean, I think that for example, 
human trafficking is a, is a consistent an abuse. There's, that's a consistent theme in Kubrick films. Um, I, I think he was he he had seen and been in all these circles. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I don't think that Kubrick himself was at the top of the pyramid. I think he realized that, you know, when he had to make deals with the Pentagon, with with the the Air Force to film certain things, and you know, after two thousand one, and this is very very well known. That's not my conspiracy theory. There's right. very clear proof of this. I think Kubrick saw the way the world really runs, mm-hmm. and he wanted to portray that in his films and critique it. Um, but that also doesn't mean necessarily that Kubrick is a a uh, totally innocent revolutionary anti-system figure. Right. I mean, he he knew this because he was working for the system. Right. And 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 again, if there is a very close connection between intelligence, the occult, and Hollywood, he probably rubbed elbows with a lot of these people as well. Was like, well, yeah. I mean, you see him with the with the top level NASA guys. NASA yeah. is just NASA is one hundred percent just a kind of a covert front for the air force deep state, uh, Pentagon. And so, I mean, I show in my, uh, 2001 analysis, you know, mm-hmm. you see Kubrick hanging out with, um, what's his name? Not just Arthur C. Clarke, but the, um, the German, the guy who was like the head of NASA at his, at his time. I forget his name. The guy that, the guy that came over from paperclip. Uh, he may have been a paperclip guy. I'm trying to remember. Werner von Braun. No, one? there's another head of NASA. Um, this is after Von Braun. This was in the 60s, 70s, late 60s, early 70s. The audio issues for that first part. Um, I think we got everything corrected. So I'm here again with Jay Dyer. We're going to pick up where we left off. Um, I believe we were starting to get into your analysis of 2001 Odyssey mm-hmm. by Kubrick. Mm-hmm. Um and you open with that it's uh, an alchemical philosophical presentation of the supposed evolutionary ascent of man from primal ape into a star child, an initiatory mm-hmm. process that purports to unfolding through aeons of brute, meaningless time, culminating in a series of revelations associated with zodiacal alignments that awaken the new stage in the process. So is is this the first film that you can recall that has the idea of the apotheosis of man, that man could become his own god through techne? Hmm, that's, that's a good question. question. There could probably be earlier science fiction films that people could think of that, that reference this, maybe obscure ones or maybe TV, a TV series or something like that. But yeah, I would say that the, the first big film that makes this idea of the central plot except for maybe metropolis i think metropolis is shooting for that with transhumanism with the robot the the horror babylon robot that's created um and that was back in the 20s but it's not explicitly transhumanism and apotheosis of man so yeah probably i would say (laughs) um probably is like as as far as i could think Especially blockbuster wise, because uh, mm-hmm. I don't think Metropolitan was uh, that big of a blockbuster. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, it's kind of before the stage of blockbusters. It was back in the 20s, so yeah. Right. You're right. And then, um, and you know, obviously, you know how important and deep is the theory of evolution in this movie? Because I think on page it was 81, mm-hmm. you say that. Um, it helps a lot of solidify the mythology as an orthodox and dogmatic given. Mm-hmm. So this uh, movie, obviously, you know, evolution is a central theme to this work. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that it's overlooked. One of the things I tried to highlight in the book was that we overlooked the fact that even our scientific so-called worldview is oftentimes informed more so by Hollywood and the arts than reading science journals or going to college and, and taking classes with uh, Mr. Wizard or Bill Nye. We, we get our worldview from movies, typically, mm-hmm. from these kinds of stories, at least in the modern world most people do. Um, they've replaced the mythologies of old 
And that's what myths are, narratives to explain man's place in the universe, the origin of the universe, where we're going. And I see Darwinism as pretty much the preeminent myth of modernity. Right. It undergirds everything from scientism to the idea of transhumanism itself. I mean, it, that's what this movie is about, is the idea. And I have a different take on it. And by the way, I don't think every movie is, a, is an initiatory right or uh, a ritual i only think actually a few are i think um eyes wide shut is intended to be that you're going along that journey with bill harford and i think 2001 is one of those right. where you're you're being shown the mythology of the elite i think the elite view it this way that there's these never-ending cycles of uh history mm -hmm. uh you can see this idea in the vedas with kali yuga and these long periods of time where there's a downturn in civilizations and then a rise of civilizations. Uh, and I think that's what we have here with, with 2001 is a, is a similar presentation of all of those cosmological, occult, scientific, transhumanist elements kind of merging into the Darwinian mythos par excellence. And you call it um, like an alchemical process. Most of your viewers pretty aware what alchemy is mm -hmm. but could you give a just a quick brief definition of, of what alchemy is yeah before the rise of modern science or um chemistry before it became its own separate strict scientific discipline it was seen in a more religious uh broad scope interconnected type of view so uh the alchemists of old were interested in trying to transmute matter into different forms doing basically again what would be the chemistry experiments of, the, of their day mm -hmm. um what we know of as alchemy tends to come from um greece ancient greece where some of the first alchemists um there's a good book on this anatomizing divinity my uh, friend of mine james kelly the first chapter in that book deals with the actual history uh, of alchemy from greece but through the middle ages what it becomes is a um almost like a type of philosophy or worldview where they are seeking the great work which is to to transmute matter into a higher stage or a higher form and then that becomes a way in a way an allegory for every individual as well to mm -hmm. transform his own thinking process and ultimately his own life into the divine or into the philosopher's stone or whatever so it functions on multiple levels there there have been alchemists who literally wanted to try to turn um, you know, uh, uh, something into gold. Yeah, like lead uh, and, to gold, and, and right? I'm not saying that they have achieved that per se, but then there have also been people who read this in a more allegorical way. If you read, I did a bunch of, when I was in grad school, I did a bunch of essays on the Elizabethan playwrights, John Don, Ben Johnson, um, poets and so forth, and they were dominated by this idea of alchemy. They right. put alchemy into all of their poetry, into their plays, <clears throat> Shakespeare does, uh, Edmund Spencer, Fairy Queen. So it's been typically also given this religio-spiritual notion of man and, and society and the world evolving into this final stage, this, this convergent stage, or this godhood type of stage, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, like, if you were to do a Wikipedia search, it would say, oh, it was when they tried to turn base lead into gold. Right. And that would be sort of what you call the exoteric explanation, where the esoteric right. is... Like you say, bringing man into the next stage of evolution, exactly, exactly. Uh, which is, I, I guess, like you say, the major theme of this movie is taking man to his next stage of evolution. Mm -hmm. The it's you know it's interesting uh, in terms of when you you know talk about how these movies help give us our worldview. They sort of fill in the blanks that we don't get from education and our family mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And I do find it interesting because even, you know, Marx, when he talked about Darwin's, you know, claim of survival of the fittest and evolution, even Marx said that that was sort of his worldview imprinted, you know, survival of the fittest, mm -hmm. of the capitalist system that was going on in his day, you know, mm -hmm. competition and so on and so forth. So I do find it interesting that, you know, your worldview will determine how you interpret the data before you. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's is, that's the root of what we call presuppositionalism is understanding that that our belief systems don't really operate like we're just neutral observers who come to the table with a neutral approach to facts, and then the facts inform us. 
it's much more complicated than that. And even even modern science has shown this with experiments that that there's actually a symbiotic relationship between what we bring to the table and read into the facts, and then what the facts read into us. You could say what we record from the facts. So there's this always kind of this constant dialogue between subject and object going on, mm-hmm. um, and what that shows us is that uh, the enlightenment ideas of kind of just the neutral observer recording the data is is really way oversimplified and, and not how humans actually interpret the world. Right, right. Um, I'm going to ask you about the monolith in this movie. Uh, you say that the monolith is consciously Luciferian. Mm-hmm. Um, with that sort of... I'm sorry. Uh, that would seem to fit into the theory of the connection between, uh, you know, alchemy, like kind of the occult and sciences together, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. The reason I say it's Luciferian is that I typically understand that in terms of ways different groups, certain maybe high level occultists, high level Freemasons, they'll look back, say, at Christianity and they'll reinterpret the message of Christianity into a kind of quasi Gnostic message where Jesus or Lucifer are kind of these liberator figures who who are there to teach man an inner secret teaching gnosis rather than the Ten Commandments or the Beatitudes or something like this. And, and so what really Christianity functions as is, is a secret key to um, see, searching out the secrets of immortality through technology. Right. So they read it in kind of that way. Um, and then the whole Bible gets reinterpreted in, in that way. And we can see people who took that view, like uh, Jack Parsons, the famous student of, of, of Crowley, who was doing all those JPL rocket experiments and thought he was going to, he believed he could connect you know, science and his occult philosophy into a means by which man could transmute and, and transcend the here and the now. So you could say there's a... Uh, 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 absolutely consciously Luciferian notion to this film and that's why I included that part in there I'm not saying that, that Kubert was necessarily following Crowley no. I'm just saying that the, the same ideological strain is present there and now 2001 is based on Arthur C. Clarke's work correct? if I read mm-hmm. that right yeah mm-hmm. so uh, you know Arthur C. Clarke um I think I read earlier in a, in a different, uh, either you did an interview or something, Arthur C. Clarke used to be like rub elbows with all of the leaders of tech and those giants, right? Am I thinking of the right author? Like that's how he was so Yeah, Clark, to- well, Clark actually was um, in the circles of people who ran with Crowley um, and, and he was in the circles of, uh, like we talked about in, in the previous questions with the high level people at NASA and the deep state. So yes, he was in those circles. He was more of a TV. Pre- he was kind of like the Bill Nye or the, the right. uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson of his day where he kind of had a scientific view, but he also, um, you know, wanted to be involved in, in, I think it was a TV presenter and he also did fiction. Okay. So, um, so that was that was what what he was up to, and that's another example where we see the the intersection between the arts, Hollywood, science fiction writers, and the deep state, right? And the occult. I might be maybe I'm mixing up my writers here. The guy who wrote uh, Minority Report. That's not Arthur C. Clarke, right? That's um, what's that guy's name? I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh well, <laughs> let's um. Moving on to the to the next chapter. This is my favorite chapter, H, uh, chapter five. We're talking about H.G. Wells. Science well, the, by the way, the, did you want to talk about the monolith? I see the monolith oh, as kind yes. of a, a representation of the unknown and ultimately a kind of um, satanic type of of presence. Um, and I that comes from from it's kind of the idea that maybe the technology that we have is alien that it's it's beyond what we understand and that maybe even ai itself is kind of this alien technology Hmm. not necessarily talking about extra biological et type of alien but higher spiritual entities and i think that's kind of the purpose of the the sequence of bowman leaving this universe is that he's getting past the realms of the gods of this universe namely the planets venus mars jupiter that way in the occultic view those would be the rulers of our 
small, you know, prison universe. And right. so Bowman is transcending that, those spatial uh, limitations of, you know, the, the six ways that you can move in space, right? Up, down, left, right, back, forward. Yeah. And so that's what Bowman is trying to do is transcend that. And so ultimately it, it kind of becomes a, 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 almost a kind of a matrix type of thing where he steps outside of the matrix. Right. And Crowley, his, I think it was called book of law. He said was basically uh, automatic written by, um, another I entity. Was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did he call it? Like a, like an interdimensional being and so on. And so yes. Forth. Correct. So perhaps this is where all this high. Well, that's what I'm saying is, yeah, from. Jack Parsons, people like that, they thought that, that when they were doing their rituals and when they were doing the drugs, they were tapping into and talking to entities that were mm-hmm. essentially the gods. Right. Very, yeah. Very interesting. Very deep. Um, so yeah, that chapter of your book is, is very fantastic for those who want to really get deeper into that. Thank you. Get the book. Um, chapter five, my favorite talk about HG Wells, science fiction propaganda. Um, I have many conversations with some of my science-leaning friends, and it always devolves into some serious arguments. So this is some of my favorite work you did. Mm. Um, you say that... <coughs> I'm sorry, let me get to the right page here. You say that the... Um, I'm sorry, let me get uh, to the right spot. Yeah, science fiction, modern science, which you call scientism and religion. You say that all three are crucial cultural drivers that disseminate a prepackaged worldview to its consumers. Can you elaborate a little bit on what that prepackaged worldview is? Sure, it's just the idea of uh, listen to the experts. The experts tell you what you're supposed to believe. They tell you how to live your life. They tell you what the, on a weekly basis now, what right and wrong is, what words you can and can't say. Um, they tell you your origins, your meaning, which is essentially that you're not anything. You are um, a bunch of goo that has just kind of happenstance tumbled through the universe. Um, the consciousness is kind of an illusion. Free will isn't really a real thing. There's no God. Uh, man is God. Uh, the scientific elite priest class will will tell you all of these things. Um, that's essentially what we're, the world that we live in, and it's going to be ruled over by a corporate technocracy. So that's pretty much everything that I talk about in all my globalism book talks, which I've done, I think, 28 of these now, where I cover the top globalists like H.G. Wells, Bertrand Russell, etc. They're all unified in in those points and saying that's what's going to happen and therefore they say that because of that given all that then it's absolutely certain that man will evolve into a world government so that's what the whole the whole kit and caboodle is about right and you'll see this theme in almost every single one of their works there's (laughs) things that you cannot question like you say Darwinism, science. Darwin world government, yeah, all that yeah. stuff is is on. Uh, you, you can't. You can be a globalist and believe a lot of different things, but you can't have you. They have kind of like their own Ten Commandments, their own yeah. creedal confession. You could say, yeah, but you can't question those. Never can. Um, and I find this um, when I read Changing Images of Man by uh, SRI, they actually talked about how there was going to be a crisis. Mm-hmm. of the you know deterministic materialistic worldview they started mm-hmm. to realize people were questioning this and we can't answer all these questions so right. the whole book is about well what do we give the people because we all unconsciously religiously believe in something whether it's a god or whether it's darwin evolution whatever we all believe in something like you say we all have a worldview and this mm-hmm. whole book is trying to figure out well what are we going to give the people so to speak and I find it interesting, towards the end of the book, they say, uh, you know, Freemasonic ideas and Nazism, uh, it kind of works, so we're just going to kind of morph into that. Mm-hmm. It's pretty interesting. And, and, and I think you said before that uh, the claims of Darwinism, it's, its overall idea, its metaphysic, is Gnostic in, in general, right? It is. I mean, the origins of, of Darwinian theory are actually 
from the Masonic Lodge, um, the, the Huxleys, the Darwins, the Galtons, their families that really promulgated this, this theory, um, they weren't inventing it. They were getting it from ancient Greek philosophy, ancient Egyptian philosophy, and ancient Vedic philosophy. Um, and that's one thing that Freemasonry does is it does study a lot of comparative religion to try to figure out the commonalities in my view, ultimately, to try to manipulate and control society. That's the whole purpose of, of why they do what they do. They're not the only group. I don't think they run everything in the world, but they're definitely a group that has been used to try to foist these ideas on, on the world. So one of those, one of the key things that they, that they do is give people from a kind of scientific Mount Olympus what the dogmas of accepted science are. And the Royal Society for a long time has promoted across the world that materialistic, Darwinistic flux worldview. Not just a, that's the thing is evolution is not just a theory about biological origins. It's actually a metaphysic about all of reality. Mm-hmm. It encompasses everything. And it was always intended to do that because it was, it was an intentional replacement of the uh, theological religious tradition mm-hmm. uh, of the West and of traditional man and in, in, uh, as a whole so um, so that is is really what I was trying to encapsulate in this chapter and I was trying to show that it, it's not just HG Wells and his science fiction it's also all these movies that are based on I mean science fiction is huge it pretty yeah. much dominates you know the blockbusters nowadays yeah. and so that's again what gives us our worldview and gives us our mythologies even if we think we're being scientific we're not realizing that a lot of the time we're actually not because science is the scientific method the scientific method is a tool for understanding the natural world for developing engineering technology etc it's not a it's impossible through the scientific method to gain a uh, grand narrative mythology that's precisely what Freemasonry does, um, and what you're talking about there with the that they realize that that Darwinism and materialism would not be enough is that yes they they knew that there would need to be some kind of religious structure that that they could create and that they could use, and this actually goes back to Auguste Comte, the the father of sociology, who himself was a kind of illuminist. Comte said that we'll just have to create some kind of new global civic religion. Um, so when you look at entities like the Esalen Institute that was given a lot of money, um, deeply connected to the deep state itself, that was there to foster the the new age. And so the new age movement and all of its different forms and, and going back to Blavatsky and Alice Bailey and Annie Besant and those United Nations character characters, uh, they are there to give the world the new civic religion that would go along with the the new Darwinian cosmology. Yeah. <laughs> I like three questions. You just answered all three of them. <laughs> mm. the, essentially, yeah, it's 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 a replacement theology. They demythologized your origins and gave you a new mythology and a new dogma. But which was supposed to be scientific, yeah. and na- and now they're reintroducing the mystical and the mysterious. Right, right, see. exactly. And and again, that was covered in Changing Images of Man. They said they were going right. to do that. That's and right. I think that's what we're seeing culminating now. And like you yes. say, you know, science fiction movies is the driver. It's the reinforcement of these ideas. Just and that's why I think a lot of the you know the, you have to also look at the counterculture, the '60s counterculture lsd tim leary all that we know that was all cia stuff i've I've documented that in a lot of books a lot uh in in my in book two i I talk quite a bit about laurel canyon and the counterculture dave mcgowan lsd um so the drug revolution and the sex revolution weren't just uh social engineering techniques they're part of this changing the image of man because Mm -hmm. as you know from that text changing the changing image of man isn't just changing man's mind about the world it's changing man's image of himself and who he is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they did come. And, you can, and it's a lot easier to reintroduce the mystical when you've got the prevalence of extreme drug use. Uh, yeah. I'm not trying to be a, pure, a, a Puritan here. I'm not saying that all drug use is necessarily wrong, but I'm saying that the specific promotion of the hallucinogenic revolution yes. in the 60s and then now the promotion of the mass big pharma, that's what it's really about. Yeah, they they actually have a, a bunch in there about combining science with the um, you know research into 
uh, telepathy Mm -hmm. and, you know, all those things. And they were saying, you know, science, we can't leave these things out. And I think uh, Harmon and all those guys were high off their butts, too. Uh, Probably. When they were writing this book, because they all right. talked about basically doing ayahuasca and all the hallucinogens right. and such like that. So, great chapter. Seriously, it's my favorite chapter of the whole book. I love it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I had to kind of do, I mean, it's it's a subtle critique of, of Darwinian philosophy. Mm-hmm. I don't approach Darwinism from the vantage point of a scientist, because my training isn't in hard science. My training is in analytical philosophy, logic. Uh, those arenas. So that's the the approach that I take to criticizing Darwinism is as a philosophic worldview. And the medium through which I do it is not just boring philosophy articles, but through the lens of film. Right. And for anybody who right. wants to read more about that outside of Jay Dyer's book, that you should go get um, Wolfgang Smith. Uh, yeah, Cosmos and Transcendence is great. It's a great yeah. book. And then even Yaki uh, does a real good mm-hmm. job of taking down Marx. Uh, Darwin Freud and, Darwin. and Freud on a metaphysical right. level as well. Not the science part, the metaphy- the explanation of what mm-hmm. science is telling you. Because people, are, like you said, they have this notion that science is unbiased, that it just tells you brute facts. And that's not what happens. It's not possible to have a yeah, brute fact because yeah. this is an important point. I don't want to take over the interview with this no, philosophy no. stuff, but it's important to understand that the reason that there's no brute factuality is is really obvious if you think about it and this is kind of what philosophy does is get us to question our assumptions and 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 no longer believe things that that are ridiculous and one of those things is the idea that like if you come to to interpret um an earthworm you see the earthworm you're studying the earthworm you're going to see what's going on with the earthworm it's impossible to approach that without thinking about and knowing about your all your previous experiences of, with earthworms and with science and with studying the species and with what you learned when you were a kid about where animals and bugs come from, what you learned in high school, what the movies told you about nature, the documentaries that you saw on History Channel or, or Discovery Channel or whatever. All of those things inform, even if you're not conscious of it, they inform your perspective of any single event when you go into the lab to study the earthworm, it's impossible to not bring all of that baggage, you could say. I'm not mm-hmm. saying it's bad. It's just it's just how it is. It's the reality it? of this world. So the so this ridiculous idea that when a scientist puts on a lab coat, when he steps through the, the doors of the lab, like he suddenly ma- takes on this magical uh, position where, where he has no more bias. He has no mm-hmm. more uh, cognitive dissonance. He has no more... Um, like he, he nobly only wants to seek the truth and he's not just concerned with getting grant money. Right. I mean, right. that is absurd. Yeah, definitely. Um, and even that, you know, people say that there's no like agenda, but behind certain sciences. And like I said, I'm, I'm reading Lily Kay's book and the entire, uh, Caltech, uh, mm-hmm. biology department and molecular biology, Got its start in funding and and base and Rockefeller and uh, Carnegie's. They drove the whole thing. Every one of their trustees was on the board of Caltech and so on and so forth. And they all called it the uh, Agenda of Man project. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's there's no non biases there. But yes, yeah, so let's move on. Uh, we're gonna get into uh, AI next, chapter eight. Um, the only question I really have about this, and this is something I struggle with, because we know you could read articles every day about AI. They're getting closer, they're getting closer, they're getting closer, and they keep creating these Autobots, and they kind of talk back to you, but there's still so much program they need to go in, but they want to create AI in the worst way. So, in the movie, essentially, um... What's the kid's name? David, right? Yeah, David. David, yeah. Yeah, so in the end, he's buried in his watery grave, and he comes out to lead this new, like you say, race, uh, and all the humans are gone. Yeah. Uh, so, Mike, why, why create AI? Why create robots just to replace us? Like, who the hell would want to do that? Well, people that that have the anti-human view. I mean, if you go down the route of the naturalistic, atheistic, materialist, hardcore Darwinian perspective, typically what comes along with that is also the its close cousin, the idea that mankind is a plague on the earth. Mankind is a cancer on Mother Gaia. 
that's the whole heart of the, the green agenda. And so what needs to happen there, as we know from like the Georgia Guidestones, the idea is to cull the population down to its top percentile, supposedly, right? Oh, we only need the 500 million of the most mm -hmm. elite people. That way, the future will be more and more and more elite people. But actually, that's, that's not really what this ideology is about. We know that's kind of a fraud because all the people that promulgated this worldview um, arbitrarily decided that they're the elite just because they are, what, some inbred family in Britain? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so it, it presupposes that they have the correct standards by which to judge the elite, which is what? IQ? I mean, are we just going to, are we going to kill everybody under, uh, what, 200 IQ? I mean, it, it, it's, it's completely arbitrary. It's, it's completely bizarre. And, and it's, it suffers the same mistake of all utopian ideologies. So this is another version of utopian ideology, which is that if I can rationally calculate something, then everything ought to, in the human world, operate this way. And if it doesn't operate this way according to perfect rational calculation, right, like communists and Soviets would, would think, then we have to destroy everybody that doesn't perfectly follow the rational calculations. But the human realm is not quantified perfectly. It's not just a bunch of rational calculations. That's one level of reality, but it's not the only level of reality. So when you try to do what's called reductionism and smush everything into just cause and effect, just algorithms, you get this idea that, well, we can just create a new being and then merge with that being, mm. download our consciousness into that being, and that's how we'll live forever. Right. But, the, but it, it, again, it only, that's only true, that's only possible if the presuppositions of materialism and Darwinism and so forth are all correct. And if they're not correct, it won't work. Right. I mean, I've always seen the chase for AI was to assist us with merging with machine, like you say, to give us that immortality. And the, you know, and the computing intelligence necessary to make that actually happen, I think, is where uh, AI comes into play. Like, I think it's necessary. I think that's why they're chasing it so hard. Mm hmm but um that was um yeah that was the only one i had in there um if you if you had some more ideas in there you want, i don't well, know I mean, your just, book. Uh, that's why i'm only asking because, certain questions well ai is interesting because it has um you know it was originally a, a kubrick script and then spielberg took over and added the alien robots at the end i mean it, some people miss this that that the ai that the robot that, that the aliens at the end are actually advanced robots mm -hmm. uh so the idea is kind of that that david is the adam if you will or the or the creator of that new race of beings that that comes along right so uh yeah i just see it as completely anti-human i mean the, the character uh the only the human character is crippled and he's a jerk and david is and all the robots are of course you know humanized and made into saintly figures and that's that's really common now in most TV shows, video games like uh, AMC's Humans or the famous video game Detroit. You have this same idea where all the humans are evil yeah. and the bots are kind of saintly. So there's a humanizing and a dehumanizing going on at once. And it's all just part of the same agenda. Right. That's sort of what you'll notice. That's the big theme is uh, we have all this sympathy for the robots in every one of these movies. Look, Terminator 2 did that. I remember mm -hmm. watching that and actually getting kind of choked up. You know, he's giving a thumbs up going down in the... It's like, you actually kind of feel like, oh, man. <laughs> you, you see the kid yeah. crying over the robot. It's pretty interesting <laughs> exactly. that they're kind of pushing that. It's like you say, that prepackaged worldview they're getting to you. Um, but going into, uh, you know, Chapter 9, uh, Minority Report. Very mm -hmm. awesome movie. Great an analysis. There's a few things that you pointed out that I, was, I never caught myself. Um... But also, I found like an article on... Like what? Was that? Like what? Um, oh yeah, maybe digging in my notes here. <laughs> um, some of the things I didn't realize was the... Okay, now i got to find my highlights. Oh, you put me on the spot. You suck. Um, you know what? We'll get to Well, that. you can delete that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, it's going it up out. just like this. People are going to have to deal with it. Um... You know what? It's probably in my notes. We'll get to that. 
but okay um yeah so 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 when we talk about minority report there was an actual uh, an article on medium about how when they did minority report that the writers and the producers um actually got with what they say icons like virtual reality pioneer Jeron Lanier and uh, Whole Earth Catalog creator Stuart Brand, and they joined folks from DARPA and the mm -hmm. Washington Post and mm -hmm. spent days dissecting cultural trends, technolo technological tra trajectories, so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. again, your thesis that the, the interconnectedness of Hollywood big blockbuster sci-fi films with the people that are creating the tech like DARPA and the people that are trying to create the cultural trends that, because uh, you know, the question is usually asked, does life imitate art or does art imitate life? I think that's the answer there because these aren't people. Yeah, it's a putting, symbiotic relationship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So again, another piece of, uh, you always put these things out and later on you'll see some, innocuous um mm -hmm. article from median or somebody else and it right. completely say everything that you said so again yeah exactly congratulate uh, you for constantly putting this stuff out before <laughs> anybody else does well there was also um i mean i'm always new learning these new facts like uh when i did annie jacobson's big book on the history of darpa she ends the book by talking about going to the pentagon and meeting with people at darpa and chris carter from x files and um, one of the pro either James Cameron or one of the producers of Terminator. So, and she was making the point that that there's always been this relationship, even back to Terminator, where where there was discussions with DARPA and the Pentagon. Pentagon would talk to the Hollywood people. Hollywood would talk to the Pentagon people. And so, it, it's always been that way. And and that's what I tried to highlight. And what was so surprising to me was because as a kid growing up, loving watching movies. You just don't think about it as such an incestuous relationship mm -hmm. that 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 they're that concerned with, even to the point of how to craft the toys, not just to sell toys related to the movies, but also to engineer and form the minds of children through the toys. I mean, that's part of what G.I. Joe is for, is to, mm -hmm. to train you to be a military recruit. Right. And the things that are in this movie... <laughs> Like uh, targeted advertising, um, retinal scans. Yeah. Um, what else did they put in there? Um, you, you, you know, you, the, you all the, the the whole plot, the predictive yeah. algorithm of uh, yes. predicting where crimes are coming is real. Yeah, which uh, it's funny that you know Obama even talked about having a pre-crime unit, and essentially, like you say, they don't use um, psychics in a in a vada glue goo. They just use. <laughs> Yeah. You know, uh, DARPA's tracking everybody's uh, social media and their yeah. GPS and all that stuff. Yeah, digitizing of all records. Correct. You know, under uh, information awareness, uh, which is like, as you point out, that's DARPA's plan for the internet all along. Correct. Um, Jacques Attali wrote about this. You covered his book, A Brief History of the Future, where basically he says everything that's given to you for comfort will be used to spy on you. Um, Yes. Even uh, Foreign Policy magazine, they had an article basically saying the exact same thing, where they talked about uh, you know, Fitbits, iWatches, mm -hmm. you name the technology, and it's it's given to you to record everything about you so they can predict your behaviors. Right. Yeah, there was uh, an article I found a long time ago about the Schwitzgabel machine, and I, I talk about that quite a bit because Dr. Schwitzgabel developed this uh, tracker for prison inmates, and it would record your heart rate, record your location, record basically health data about you. Back in the 70s is when he came up with this. The idea was that if you just lock this on the leg of the prisoners, uh, you, you won't have to worry so much about guards watching the prisoners because if they're running away, <laughs> you'll know from the uh, beeps of the uh, raised heart rate and the locate the you know the location of where they're going, so um, that's essentially what would morph into the digital tracker that we all wear with Apple Watch, mm -hmm. iPhone, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, yes, and quite literally, the ideas for a lot of these these products and gadgets 
they don't come from the free market of people just coming up with the best product. The, the free market is there as a one level to kind of pick out and choose out the ideas that seem to work the best. But if you look at something like planned obsolescence, that actually shows you that we don't live in a free market. We live in a, a con- very, very controlled market because a lot of products are, are raised to a level and given status that others uh it's impossible to get. So, for example, Apple has always worked with DARPA mm-hmm. from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Almost all the big tech companies were started with seed money from InQtel, CIA, etc. Right, right. So they're right. not they're not you know the best, smartest guys working the hardest in their garage. That's just simply not true. Right. Yeah, things like Facebook uh, don't come out of some dude's garage. Things like yeah. Amazon, they don't come out of some dude's garage. Right. There's, you know, again, like I said, the book, you know, uh, the bi- uh, molecular biology just doesn't come about by itself. There's, there's <laughs> millions and millions of dollars that goes into those things. Yeah, it's a lot of R and D, uh, and you know that's why one thing about all the censorship is people are saying, well, they're private companies. They're not private companies. Not. Every one of these big tech companies is. Uh, as far as I know, they still get government money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then th- this idea that you can't predict uh, man's behavior just by knowing more things about him, that kind of goes hand in hand with like material uh, determinism, doesn't it? It does. I mean, uh, on one level, there's an extreme view that you could have a total predictive accuracy of somebody on the basis of their previous habits and their psychological profile and all that. But again... Uh, I mean, they'll never be able to achieve omniscience. So I think that the idea is just to have the highest level of accuracy possible, um, which if you dumb people down and make them more and more a slave to their passions, a slave to their phone, a slave to their to their whatever, um, whatever enslaves them, then they're much more predictable. You know what they're going to do. Uh, so uh, I don't think that, now, some of them have, you know, a religious conception of this where they actually think that they might achieve omniscience. But uh, whether they do or they don't, they're more concerned, I think, with just coming up with the predictive accuracy. And, and one of the things that amazing about science fiction is that that's kind of something that Asimov predicted a long time ago. He put that in the Foundation series that there would be mass algorithms that could track mass movements and, and try to forecast uh, where the trends are going. Right. And, and you made a point on page 184 about DARPA, Google, Apple, Microsoft, that they are all sons of the military-industrial complex. Absolutely. And you say even though they look like they compete, they all have the same goal. And my very first podcast was talking about uh, Virginia Hine and Luther Gerlach. Uh, they created what they call a SPIN. It's a segmented polycephalous network. Where they yes, basically actually, say, uh, Annie Jacobson talks about this in her DARPA book. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. They, they, you know, uh, even though they're all individual, their own hierarchical structures, they still mm-hmm. have a horizontal connection. And she says they're all linked on ideology. They might not agree on how to do everything. They might not agree right. on procedures and such, but they all have the same end goal. Exactly. That's what we've seen. That's, I mean, if people doubt this, what is Bilderberg? Bilderberg right. is the same idea. Um different companies, all the tech elite, all the big corporate elite, they get together every year and they, they discuss global policy. Right. I mean, it's not hard to figure out. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then, um, is there anything else you wanted to bring up about Minority Report? Uh, not off the top of my head, no. All right, yeah. I mean, if I don't ask you a question and you really wanted to talk, because I don't want to give away your book either. I want people to read this. So if there's something you want to make a point on, jump right in and make that point. Well, I mean, there's a lot here. So, you know, there's 363 pages, 404 yeah. footnotes. So um, it's, it's, it's a, would you say it's meaty information? Very, very. Okay. I mean, the amount of, um, you know, how citations that you have, like so many um supporting evidence that you have that you're just not making crap up off the top of your head you literally have cited information from legitimate sources to, to mm-hmm. make your points and that's something that people should know this isn't just some like conspiracy book this isn't some um you know hollywood scandal book i mean he, right he, this is really tying in real world stuff that they actually reveal sort of in the movies mm-hmm. which getting into the next one chapter 10 logan's run didn't even hear about logan's run until um, not too long ago, mm-hmm. you talked about it. I watched the movie, 1976, super corny, but still was a pretty decent movie. 
But yeah. one of the p things you point out is how this is a uh, smart city, essentially. Yeah. Um, you talk about, uh, I think, what was the lady's name from IBM? She actually had to talk about how they're going to build. Jenny Romady. Was that? Jenny Romady. Yes. CEO There's, of IBM. Yeah. yeah, you talk about how essentially you're going to have a, a an entire smart city that's basically ran by an AI bot. Which Correct. Which is sort of the theme of this um, yes. movie. And again, it's 76, and they're talking about doing these things now. So, mm -hmm. you know, how far ahead of their time were they doing this? So... You know the the writers and creators of this. Um, did they have any um, connections to the? Um, the I try. I can't remember the the guy who. It's a novel. It's a sci fi novel, dystopian novel. I don't remember the author's name, but it was not super famous, but medium famous sci fi novel. Kind of had uh, all the same themes that all the sci fi dystopian movies have. But I think what stood out to me in this one was. The AI smart city, as you pointed out, and then also the idea of the allegory of the cave, because uh, you know, spoiler alert: there's there's this. It's a, it's a kind of an allegory of the cave, Plato, Socrates type of story. Right. And on that, there's also the notion of um, controlled population, mm -hmm. controlled that, that basically a, a radical form of euthanasia where everybody dies at age thirty. Right. And it's and what they've done is they've concocted a religion. That has fooled the masses in, into in the smart city into believing this that that it's actually part of your religious duty to to float up into this big microwave and burn up when you're, when you're thirty. Uh, and they have this really weird death cult that's uh, that, that surrounds this red lotus, uh, which I just thought all that was really fascinating um, in a sci-fi movie. And, and as we know. Uh, you know, the, the character essentially escapes the city and realizes that most of the worldview that he was given was a lie. Right. Uh, and that there's a whole world out there. And that was very common, for whatever reason, in a lot of 70s sci-fi stories, that they tended to have a pro-human, um, pro-population, um, anti-depopulation narrative. Yeah. Like a whole of, there's a whole bunch of these in the 70s. So uh, I just thought that was worth including. So what, what I what I had to do in my book was I had many, many more essays on film than went into this book. So I had to kind of choose them by directors and themes, mm -hmm. mainly directors in this one. And then in the second book, I chose them on the basis of themes strictly. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought I just thought it was so because there was so much in this section of part one about sci fi that you we needed to see these the insights in these 70s dystopias like this and zardoz and you know it's funny because you actually talk about how it says uh fiction once again presages reality here with the recent proposals to allow ibm's watson supercomputer to manage health care for u.s citizens as the affordable care act begins you think that was the purpose of obamacare was to get everybody on this ai system I think they were testing that out. Um, I don't know that they really thought it would fly yet, but um, the, a lot of times what they'll do is test runs on this kind of stuff to see how well it it went over. And even if it doesn't, then what they'll do is they'll gauge and say, all right, well, uh, it'll probably take us another 15 years to pass mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Probably take us another 30 years to get that working. Mm -hmm. um, so there can be test runs and and even if something fails initially, it doesn't mean, oh, we won, ha, ha, we beat them. They're just going to reintroduce it 15 right. years later under some other form. Well, and we see the cries for health care now, you know, free health care, you know, with Bernie and, and all those people. Right, right. And so, I mean, you see people that, like, really scream that, you know, health care is a human right and stuff. They really can convince people of just about anything. Exactly. Um, like you said, they can compel, convince women to kill their offspring. I mean, what can't you convince people to do? As a yeah, right. just like they convince people to at age thirty, you float up into a big microwave and <laughs> exactly. melt. It's so funny how that, like you say, how how it mirrors real life. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and then on page one ninety two, the idea of sanctuary, because like you say, Logan, and uh, I forgot the female's name, um, but they think they they found the the sanctuary, mm -hmm. um, and they just found it was just another trap. Um, do you see anything today, like any of today's movements, uh, even today's conspiracies or ideas? I mean, do you see that? I think they understand that people are going to reject this system. Some people could be smart enough. Some people just won't accept it whatsoever. So they need to have 
that that catch all that trap to get those the supposedly dissidents just like this so yeah this i mean most of the re revolutionary movements that have been there in the last few hundred years most of the revolutionary ideologues most of the causes foundations movements human rights they're all those traps right right absolutely a large i'm not everybody in alternative media but a large portion of alternative media is a trap and many of them are i just funded by all the same elites that is just called alternative media right right yeah i've i've always been kind of 50 50 on the alex jones thing sometimes always felt that wow he's getting well i was thinking more like the the openly known ones like yeah. uh young turks you know i mean they yeah get, yeah uh, like uh daily beast buzzfeed those are conceived of as alternative yeah. media they're actually given like millions of dollars from big foundations yeah Quigley talks about J.P. Morgan basically creating the progressive movement and creating yes. li the liberal pre the new republic still goes on today. The founder Correct. of the Atlantic used to be the, the main editor for the new republic. So yeah, I mean we know that the the left has been funded. So even outside the left right paradigm, though, yeah. I'm saying you can have these kind of fake um, you know revolutionary movements that could be perceived of as a sanctuary. Oh, right. we'll find, uh, there's a lot of religious movements that could be, that are fake sanctuaries where you try to flee the, the troubles of modernity in this world. Mm -hmm. Then you find out you're in some stupid cult yeah. <laughs> that, that's got a bunch of money from, you know, some zillionaire and some foundation. So, yeah. uh, yeah, there are plenty of, of analogs to the fake sanctuary. Yeah. Um, Moving along, unless you have something else to to add mm. to Logan's. Oh, actually, I, let me throw this at you real quick. There's a European tech survey that was done earlier this year, and they asked Europeans from all these different countries, a lot of the EU countries, about uh, what they think about their leaders. And they said, it was odd, 25% of Europeans are somewhat or totally in favor of letting AI make important decisions about running of their country. We are so close to Logan's run. It is insane. Yeah, I mean, they, they want it to spit out, you know, actuaries and say, oh, well, uh, you know, based on your health analysis, uh, you run the risk of X, Y, Z. Uh, if you don't stop doing this, then we'll cut off your insurance, we'll cut off your credits, we'll cut, do this, that. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, and by the way, we've determined that uh, everybody over age 40 is hurting the planet. So right. there needs to be peaceful euthanasia. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Death panels. Yeah. Bill, Gates, Bill Gates talks about the death panels. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable how close we are to that. A lot of people don't see that coming, but it's, yeah, you do a great job of pointing those things It's coming. Out. It's yeah, coming. it's coming. Um, the next movie I'm going to jump into, jump forward a couple of chapters, unless you wanted to have anything specific about Zardoz, uh, Zardoz, Zard, I can't pronounce it, Zardoz, mm -hmm. or Labyrinth or anything like that. I didn't really have any questions about any of those, mm -hmm. um, but Legend, uh, Tom Cruise, mm -hmm. that was one of my favorite, I was a kid when that came mm. out. Me too. Um, one of my favorite movies. And you say, I, I didn't catch this before, but Tim Curry's character, he's not the devil. He represents darkness. And like you say, this movie is, um, I guess, kind of like a coming of age uh, sexually of mm -hmm. the, the main female character. And uh, I never, I don't analyze movies the way you do, but I didn't see that overall. So, uh, again, to everybody out there, this is why you read Jay's work, because he's going to point some things out that you're not going to catch. Well, the, I didn't catch this until I actually have a version of the, uh, of the movie that has a, an alternate musical score. So there's different versions of this movie, oddly enough, and, and one of them has an alternate musical score with a, a weird song at the end. And I was paying attention. I, most a lot of times when I do my analysis, I'll have the um, um, captions on so I can see what the screenplay says, um, or what the words and the songs might be. And I noticed the words in the song at the end in this alternate version DVD that I have, uh, which it, it is a really Scott version. But the 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 lyrics were all total Gnosticism, and it was like really in your face in the lyrics of this of the song at the end of the film 
So I was like, you know what? I need to rewatch that and think about it again. And when I rewatched it, looking for kind of the, I guess you could say, sex magic type of innuendos, they're everywhere. It's all obvious. And and yeah, you're right. Uh, Tim Curry is actually um, an underling of what you could call the devil. I guess he he's not actually Satan himself, but um, he attempts to seduce the princess uh it's very phallic he wants to mate with her and then what happens is that she goes back to jack who kind of represents innocence and nature Uh, that's what she was supposed to represent and so the the defiling of the unicorn absolutely when i went back and rewatched it i was like it was so obviously pregnant with all these sexual images and and another reason i was cued into that was the fact that labyrinth was the exact same with Mm -hmm. with sarah and her journey into her unconscious it's actually happening during puberty if you if you watch the film it's about her becoming an adult Mm -hmm. uh and the same thing is happening here with lily this is lily and jack's innocence being lost uh through sex and so in a way it's a kind of a gnostic telling of the fall of adam and eve Hmm. through sexual imagery that's what i think is going on here right um, in some of it's amazing how you can draw in works of Dante and Plato <laughs> and a lot of these significant writers through time. You can bring in the themes of their works from such a long time ago into these movies. Um, my question, one of my questions is, you know, if, if people are unfamiliar with Plato or Aristotle or Dante or any of these, you know, people, what is the purpose of putting them into you know big blockbuster films well anybody who studies literature uh, most people who want to write or go on to write study literature and when you study literature you study the classics of literature and there are classics most not all the time but most of the time for a reason because they tell us something about you know the human experience they're insightful into human psychology they're they tell us truths beyond um the nightly news so a big part of it is just that everybody who writes studies lit Mm -hmm. so you're you're gonna know these and there's also archetypal stories there's archetypal patterns in stories um so you when you recognize those archetypal patterns and characters um it's kind of unavoidable that when you make a story you're going to be utilizing some of those same ideas so you're playing with it's impossible to be completely original there's right. always going to be elements of patterns and archetypes that come from especially the classics. Mm-hmm. So that's why they're always we're always going back to Dante or or, uh, or Plato or something like that is because it's unavoidable. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also have a lot of truths. I mean, they speak to us on a deep level because they they tell us truths on many levels. Right. If you had anything else, we'll go into the next one if you want to. That's fine. All right. Um, Blade Runner, chapter mm. 15. Another very significant movie, big blockbuster. Your analysis, very deep. Thank very you. Good. Um, one of the main things, again, in this one, sort of like Logan's Run, but way better, is you know, you see in this movie genetic engineering, you see AI. You see that megacorps are in de facto governments. We see false memories implanted, like uh, MK Ultra, full spectrum dominant surveillance. They can surveil everything, and anything about you at all times. There's a synthetic overlay, um, and again, the theme that man can become God. Mm-hmm. All these themes are represented in this movie. Uh, yeah, in this movie. Um, and you do a don't fantastic- forget sex bots and yeah, uh, sex bots. nanotech and Roy Batty as a Luciferian character. <laughs> yeah, I mean literally every almost and funny and again I'm gonna I'm gonna bring somebody else up. You know Jacques Attali and mm-hmm. I think it was 1991. He wrote a book called Millennial Winners and Losers in the Coming World Order, mm-hmm. and he actually says on page 10 he says Ridley Scott's celluloid fantasy blade runner a hollywood confection that contains more truth about the coming age than do some of the classics he was talking about wow so so again (laughs) again you write about how this reveals so much more 
And even even through all those 70s and 80s, you make a point of all these dystopian movies. They're pieces of the puzzle. They're not right. always just the full picture. Here's what it's going to be. They're little pieces of all the puzzles. But I think most of it is encapsulated in Blade Runner, right? It would definitely be one of the most all-encompassing. Um, I can't think of a dystopia that would be more insightful off the top of my head. It's certainly one of the most insightful. Absolutely. Because like you said, I mean, you could just run a checklist of, you know, how many uh, things it checks off. Uh, and by the way, the implanting of, mem of memories, reprinting and all that, that's actually part of MK Ultra. So Blade Runner checks off MK Ultra big time too. And, and AI actually, uh, Cyborg's AI Android research also comes out of MK Ultra. A lot of people don't know that, but uh, if you read John Marx's book, the last chapter shows that, and he wrote that back in the late seventies. So um, I would say yes. I would say Blade Runner checks off more of the overall. The only thing I can think of that maybe it, does it have drugs? The only thing I can't think of it having is the drug stuff. Does anybody is anybody on pills or drugged out or mass drugs in Blade Runner? I, I can't remember anybody doing that, but that's really the only big key part that maybe Blade Runner left out. Yeah, I can't. I think in part two. Oh, yeah. but don't forget the sex bots, which yeah, are coming. Yeah, sex bots. Yes. Yeah, because the um the 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 two um replicants are sex were they were sex bots, right? That's what they were built for. Yeah, yeah that's insane. Um. Yeah. Well, the Daryl the Daryl Hannah character was yeah. a pleasure model. Okay. You say, uh, for the viewer who has eyes to see, they are seeing the future itself as well as the worldview of the ruling class. Mm -hmm. In fact, Blade Runner ranks with Eyes Wide Shut as one of the most explicit revelations of the method of the ruling oligarchs. You say, I, <laughs> I, I, sometimes I'm at a loss for words mm. with you know how accurate um, you know this can be portrayed. And I think you said Philip. Now Philip K. Dick. I think that was the guy I was trying to think of earlier. No, he was the guy who rubbed elbows with the, right. the tech Silicon giants Valley. and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. So right? so he was hanging out with Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley back in the '70s. So he also had done a lot of drugs, and he had also imbibed a lot of Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. uh, so when he writes Ubik, you know, he predicts the internet. When he writes, he wrote Minority Report. He wrote Blade Runner. Uh, you know. Uh, well, he wrote the short stories that would become those things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think that he 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 had special insight because of being in those circles. And and what he shows us, I think, is that the worldview of the tech elite. I think he's telling us the worldview of the tech elite. Is what I'm trying to say. Right. And and it's it is gnostic. It is it does involve a lot of drug use. You know, a lot of those. Silicon Valley elites were were tripping acid, doing all the same drugs. They they do they even talk about it openly now. Right. They microdose every day or whatever. Um, so yes, that that I think shows us the spirit from which they are drive deriving their their uh, milieu, their worldview. Right, and so like in movies like this, when they show you technology that's twenty years ahead, thirty years ahead. It's not just some guy's creative and just thinking of something like, no, he knows this stuff is generally coming. No, he um, knew that that's what they were working on. Yeah, I and mean, they were working on AI a long time ago. Yeah. yeah um, I, I can't say how advanced they were a long time ago, or, but they were projecting, you know, that that's what would be the case. Just like Asimov is projecting there will be this kind of internet thing. Yeah. Uh, they're all doing the same thing, projecting where it will go on the basis of what they saw at the time and saying, oh, that'll lead to X, Y, Z. Right. So, my next question, why don't we have flying cars yet? This pissed me off. Where's well, one cars? of the things that, that a lot of people thought was that the the coming tech utopia would give you all of these, all of this ease and freedom. And what we're learning is that it's not the tech utopia, it's the tech dystopia. Mm -hmm. And so, why would they want to give you flying cars when they want to restrict travel, commerce, and movement? Right. So it was a trap. That's what it was. They said, "We'll give you, well, free, we'll give mean, you flying yeah. cars if you let us do all this crazy shit." Basically. I mean, the all of the the goodies will be for the top one percent. Yeah. 
So there probably will be flying cars. There already are flying cars, but yeah. uh, they're not very practical. Uh, but you know, they're what a million dollars. I mean, like who's yeah. going to, uh, that's not, it's, that's not for you. Uh, just like the latest medical advances aren't for the mm-hmm. masses. They're for, they're for the, the billionaire class. Right. And speaking of that, like there was, um, again, you see all these tech articles all the time where they talk about, we're so close to AI. We're about to break through on this technology. We're yeah. going to break through on that technology. This is going to allow us to, to fix all these diseases and this, that, and the other thing. And every time I read one of these articles, you know, and I, you know, I have certain friends that, you know, post these things on, you know, Facebook. Oh, I can't wait. Like Joe Rogan, this dude cannot wait to merge with machine. Um, but I, you know, always, always try to make a point that, you know, these, these things that are coming, they're, they're not meant for us. I don't, I don't believe they're meant for us. Like you say, I think that, uh, the competition is there, um, to drive out the best ideas. Um, but you know, the way people freak out about inequalities economically, socially, and so on and so forth, you know, even the guy for Facebook, you know, he's like, we're going to create a technology where I can live 200 years, 300 years. He's like me and my family. He said me and my kids are going to be able to. And you think mm-hmm. about we already have the tools necessary for these super wealthy to pass down their wealth through these foundations, control mm-hmm. their wealth without any taxation and such like that. Now imagine when these guys can take this wealth and keep it for 200 years, you know, and live that long. Imagine Rockefeller living 200 years. It would suck. Right, that would be the goal, um, and I'm sure there will be advances in life extension. But uh, again, as you're pointing out, that's not really for for the rest of us, um, and that's kind of what DARPA has sold us for a long time with these like wounded warrior project, and oh, we're going to give uh, you know the guy who lost his hand in Desert Storm or whatever Iraq, we're going to give him a bionic hand as he's because he, he's a special test case or whatever yeah. for free. You get a million dollar bionic hand for free, um, and really that kind of stuff is just uh, propaganda. It's just it's just there to promote the idea that uh, that tech is going to save you. Right. Tech's not going to save you. They're all eugenicists. Bill Joy wrote mm-hmm. that famous essay a long time ago about how the future doesn't need us. So they're all post-humanists, which yeah, means that yeah. they believe that it's time to move past humanity. Um, I don't know. I mean, if any one of them does, doesn't accept the depopulation agenda, they would not be welcomed into the club. Yeah. Um, so they might still be rich. They might that may, they might be an outlier. I'm sure that there will be uh, elites and rich, wealthy people who don't go along with the plan, um, but they won't be the norm. Right. Yeah, there was a, an Economist article where they said that you know genetic engineering will lead to things that Darwin could only have imagined, and it was uh, an article by the Economist. Keep and- in mind too that also I am of the view that a lot. I'm not saying there aren't fantastical advances but we're in a situation where there is a lot of bs Mm -hmm. and even we know now after all the lies of the establishment over the last several years russia gate weapons of mass destruction on and on and on so many lies it's not any different in the scientific realm Mm -hmm. Um, they will churn out these bogus science advanced stories all the time Mm mm-hmm uh, and I've seen them for years. And oh, supposedly we can now clone this. Supposedly we can now do X, Y, Z. And then you actually read into it, like when they had the ear on the back of the mouse, they said, "Oh, look, we've cloned an ear and genetically grown an ear in the back of a mouse." When you actually read what they did, that's not what they did. All they did was stick ear cartilage inside the skin of a mouse. Mm. <laughs> they didn't really clone an ear. Uh, and but what they're calling cloning is that. Uh, oh, the the cartilage continued to grow in the back of the mouth, right. uh, the, the back of the mouse. Um, so they didn't actually grow an ear on the back mm-hmm. of a mouse. Uh, and so what I'm saying is that there's a lot of even large scale bullshit when it comes to look how advanced we've gotten. And, yeah, and it's yeah. for a reason. It's to make people think. And I'm not saying there aren't amazing advances. There are. But I'm saying that it's not. You're well within your epistemic rights to doubt a lot of these yeah. out there stories. Yeah. I, you know, when I see the whole, you know, uh, genetic engineering and such like that, I also think about Bertrand Russell. You know, he mm-hmm. talked about in his, you know, uh, scientific outlook, 
where he basically said, once we figure this out, we're going to have two species of humans. Right. We're going we're to have the elite that govern over, and we're going to have the dumbed-down workers that are just going to be muscular apes to do all our dirty work for us. And uh, I point that every time someone celebrates this stuff, I'm like, guys, this is not good. It's not good for us. I hope they don't figure it out. Really yeah, and except that they move past that now, and they don't even care about dumb muscular workers. Um, they actually want uh, either an autistic yeah. um, computer class that just does coding Coders, and things like yeah. that, uh, and then robots will do everything else. Yeah, and that's another reason for it. See, that's the thing that scares me too. I don't want to get too off topic, but with the AI thing, like if they can create essentially a class of between robots and autistic coders to manage the robots and you have a planet of 7 billion people to feed what's to stop them from saying like you say ah, you know what we've got no more use for labor and we don't have a use for consumers anymore we need just enough people to sustain this life we can right. genetic alter our kids to where our kids are going to be 180 IQ geniuses 6 foot 2 200 pounds we don't need the masses anymore because I, I, I feel like now they still need us for labor. They still need a talent pool, need, you know, because they can't control IQ yet. So they still need enough people to pull the talent pool. So I think once they're done and they, they lock down mm -hmm. the genetic engineering, creating super geniuses, I, I think we're screwed. I think that's when they're going to because you've you've you, we're about to get into the bond section and Prom Prometheus. But we talk you talk about the breakaway civilization that's constantly shown in a lot of these movies. Right. Uh, it's not in your book, but the one with Matt Damien, uh, I think is uh, Elysium. Elysium. Yeah. yeah. Where they had the breakaway civilization and such like that. It was just like, you're going to leave the planet. It's like, you guys do whatever you want, either that or depopulation, which, like you said, it's one of the Ten Commandments of the globalist is depopulization, uh, depopulation. On a mass scale, right? Uh, yeah, on a mass scale. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you want to jump into Bond? Sure. Bond, uh, you said you wrote your thesis on Bond, right? Correct. Yes. Um, the first one you talk about is Diamonds Are Forever. And you, you make a statement. And I want you to elaborate if you could. But you say G.I. Joe is the arm of Cobra and Bond is the arm of Spectre. Um, this, as you say, in the Bond movies, they revealed the the way uh, things really work. You know, that uh, between the illegal drug trade, between, you know, uh, the sex trafficking, between all these things, um, these are the, the level levers of power. And if you could just... just Kind of explain how how Bond is the the arm of Spectre and GI Joe is the arm of Cobra. Yeah, because uh, you know James Bond is the emissary; he's the assassin of the Queen's uh, Imperial Secret Service. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we know about the history of the British Empire, we know that the British Empire is essentially a global Masonic uh, organization that uh, eventually declined, and then we have the, the rise of the American Imperium, but the British Imperium gave way to the American Imperium. And essentially, it's just the Anglo-American establishment, as Quigley calls it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what Bond represents, and, and what Bond is there to do is to uh, project onto all of the opponents of the British Imperial system the very things that secret service british intelligence etc themselves did right so that's the point of that of that comment just like in gi joe you have Co gi joe and cobra uh and they're actually the same they're on the same team that's right. kind of the point of of what i was saying with gi joe there was that uh in the real world james bond works for specter and it's james bond who is the uh busy bee busybody of bilderberg of blofeld Mm -hmm. That's the point. Mm -hmm. So would you say that Spectre is, excuse me, over the government, controls the government, uh, horizontal equal Absolutely. to the government? Well, in the novel, Spectre uh, emerges out of Smirsh. Smirsh was Soviet counterintelligence. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> in the first couple stories, Ian Fleming actually put that 
into the novels as who James Bond was fighting, right? Because it's the free West versus the, the evil Soviets in the, in the cold war dialectic. And so back then that's when Ian Fleming was writing when it was, it was the fresh into the cold war period. And then what he tells us interestingly or early on, this is one of the, the reasons that Ian Fleming is so fascinating in terms of predictive programming is that Smirsch quickly becomes specter. Uh, just go watch, um, Dr. No and uh, uh, From Russia with Love because within a few within the first few Bond movies uh, it moves into becoming not a Soviet thing but an international mm -hmm. terror organization mm -hmm. you say Bond so he's telling first? us that he's telling us that the Cold War will, will become war on terror okay. So that you said that's the first movie that sort of brings that out, right? That, that we I'm go from the Cold of. War to international terror. Right, that I'm, that I'm aware of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There could be some other spy movie I don't know about that, that does that. I don't know. I think that's, I think that's accurate. Uh, it's the first one I can think of. Um, and then you, you say on 257, and, and, and this is a big point, is that the world government that pr presently exists is one of covert hidden rulership by various mm -hmm. oligarchs. Mm -hmm. While a certain level of competition is tolerated, these mm -hmm. oligarchical Dr. Knows are not the denizens of secret uh, Soviet underground layers, but the Bilderberg attendees and banking magnets. Mm -hmm. um, again, my very first podcast was on the Spin Networks, and she lays this all out as well. I think she wrote it in 77, where basically the major corporations, the... Uh, families, the banking families, the mm -hmm. international banks themselves, IMF, BIS, World Bank, all those, mm -hmm. they all work in concert. And Absolutely. That is your world government. That's Spectre. Yeah, that's yeah. the real Spectre. That's the real right. power in the world. And the irony is that, that one of the me key means that they have cloaked themselves from public purview is by movies like James Bond indoctrinating the public into thinking that the good West is saving him from all these villains when yeah. the people that run the good West yeah. are the people you're talking about. Yeah, spreading liberal democracy. That's the whole point, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's yeah. not really liberal democracy. It's not. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It doesn't. Um, the, uh, the Moonraker chapter... Uh, was your one about the breakaway uh, civilization like we talked about before. Um, it was odd, you know, the scene about the, the fake moon landing. And you talk about, you know, NASA mm -hmm. is um, a cover, essentially, for all right. DARPA and all these things. Exactly. Um, would you say, like, they're really trying to create, like, Skynet? Like, NASA is a cover for, essentially, Skynet? Yeah. There, uh, I have a whole lecture I did... Uh... Three years ago in Texas, uh, and then I covered it again last year at AV9. And my, and my, those lectures are public on, on YouTube. You can watch those lectures. They actually talk about the declassified uh, uh, Pentagon DARPA documents from, that, from the 80s in the Star Wars Defense Initiative where they wanted to create Skynet. Skynet is based on that. Right. Yeah. Um, now, I don't, I don't think that they literally have um, a conscious... AI yeah. network, but what they have is uh, moving towards this uh, fully uh, integrated um, Internet of Things that taps into all of these nodes and networks. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's essentially like a giant surveillance thing, more so than it is. Uh, and there is AI predictive involved in it, but it's not like a... Um, it's not like Skynet is, is is conscious and he's telling the military what to do. The military they do have AI that can give you these different actuaries and situations and what to do in this this case this case this case. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not consciously like talking to them and saying, uh, yeah, "Doctor Rumsfeld, thank you for coming." You know, mm -hmm. I I have now done my projection. If you've seen the movie Demon Seed, I did a video on Demon Seed. That's yeah. how they. That, well, that's actually, I mean, that's a silly sci-fi horror movie, but it has this idea in it where basically the, the, the tech corporate elite, Pentagon elite, are consulting this AI thing about how to run everything. 
Um, and that's partly true, but what happened, of course, in the movie, it becomes ridiculous because it becomes sentient and then it, it wants to impregnate a woman, <laughs> but it's actually worth watching though. Cause there, there are, are some, um, insightful predictive elements in mm. developments in, uh, in demon seed, but, um, I don't think it's like that, but, but they do have, you know, this sort of advanced pre-crime type stuff that we right. were talking about with minority report. Definitely. Um, and in the Moonraker uh, chapter, when you when you say, um, you know, Drax intends to become a new god whose progeny will all call him the new mm -hmm. man, the new creator through technology. Again, mm -hmm. the apotheosis of man. Exactly. A, a theme that we consistently seem to see. And even in, in the Bond movies. Um, something I didn't catch. Now, granted, I'm not going to lie. I didn't grow up on Bond. I didn't watch a lot of Bond. Mm -hmm. So I found your channel and you talked about Bond a lot. And I'm like gotta watch this because i don't remember it you know any of these things mm -hmm. so it's it's very very good analogy. well me too i mean well, I, I i did grow up watching james bond movies but um my growing up period was bond in the late 80s and early 90s so i was watching timothy dalton and pierce okay. brosnan and and all of those have a lot of pre predictive programming too it's just i haven't i haven't gotten to all of them it's yeah. the, the, i mean there's you know 24 or 5 bond yeah, movies yeah. and then then there's, you know, all the novels. And um, when I was doing my thesis, I was doing it just on, I had to narrow it down and I had to select a few of the, of the stories and mm -hmm. Ian Fleming. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. I mean, if you just look up James Bond on, on Amazon, you'll get countless books. I mean, you could yeah. never, you could never read them all. But um, so, so these essays are actually aren't what I wrote in terms of thesis. These are just other essays that I wrote as I was working through uh, the different Bond films. And I've seen them all many times now, but every time I watch one, I, I catch new stuff. Like mm -hmm. even, even in these older ones, like with um, Emilio Largo and uh, Thunderball and, and things like that, like you start to notice, Oh, that's like really similar to Aristotle Onassis, who was a, you know, big elite, globalist character and you start to realize these figures uh, kind of do match up to people because actually ian fleming was hanging out with aristotle and mm -hmm. he actually offered to fund dr no to 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 film it so so he was running in the circles of the elite so that's another reason why when you see uh you know a fabulous zillionaire on a giant yacht with a with a white cat there really are people like that <laughs> it's it's not a joke it's real that was the point of my book, of my book in part. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny is it, it's been a, a while ago that I found out that you know he was uh, you know, British intelligence that he anyway, he was a high level black high ops level, guy. yeah, and his family was very wealthy and very connected, and that he uh, Roald Dahl and mm -hmm. um, Bill what's his name Bill Donovan set Bill up Donovan our, Noel Coward yeah yeah all those guys set up our OSS correct which later became our CIA. I, exactly. I don't think a lot of people. I actually told somebody Nobody recently. Knows that. Yeah, I, I told somebody recently <laughs> about how you know Ian Fleming. You know the guy who wrote Bond. Oh yeah, he was a British spy. Really? What? I'm like, yeah, he actually helped us set up our spy unit. What? A lot of people didn't know that. Um, I of course didn't know until a couple years ago when I read your work. Well, some I, of the operations that he was involved in uh, with the Allies, they the titles of those operations actually later became Bond stories. Right. So right. Golden Eye uh, is an operation that he was doing against uh, uh, fascist in Spain, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, his, his novels that later became movies, there's a lot there. This guy didn't oh, yeah. just create stuff out of whole cloth. This is probably a lot, of, like you said, a lot of real missions, a lot of real people that he wrote into these, these novels that became movies. And I don't, I want to stress too, that I'm not overplaying this. I realize that all of these are goofy and Hollywooded up. Mm -hmm. But the, the point of my essays is just to point out that there's a lot more reality in them than you would think. Mm -hmm. right. I'm not saying that like every single thing in the Bond stories is, <laughs> oh, you know, Ian Fleming actually did all that shit. No, right. it's, not, it's not like that. Bond is actually a combination of a whole bunch of people. He's a combination of, of old British spies. Um, Maxwell John D., right? Knight. John D. John D. Of, yeah. plays into it. Um and and Ian Fleming himself. So yeah. he's he's a combination of, of people. Um, and by so, the way, did you know that um, that he based Blofeld uh, and Le Chiffre on Crowley? 
I did not, but I think you cover that in your book, don't you? Yeah, the two the two villains, well, the two well known villains from yeah. Bond. Um, in the more recent Casino Royale, it's Mads Mikkelsen, this Le Chiffre, you know, his yeah, his eye drips blood. blood. Yeah. Uh, that's based on Crowley, and then the bald Blofeld character is based mm. in part on Crowley. Interesting. Interesting. And now, did he did he personally know Crowley? Did he hang out with Crowley? No, the, there's not evidence that we know that he personally met him, but he knew of him right. and. Um, it was actually him and his other, the people he worked with in his, in his unit, his, uh, psyops unit, they were the ones that were actually contacting Crowley and working with Crowley as a, a part-time MI5 asset. Yeah. Cause, cause, uh, Crowley was a, you know, part-time spy for the British, right? Yeah. I think it was Maxwell Knight is the guy who was, uh, Knight was actually into the occult. So he was in the circles of those people. Hmm. Um, and Dennis Wheatley, who is another famous British intelligence guy, he wrote a whole bunch of books, occult books. We uh, in in Esther Hollywood, we did uh, the Devil Rides Out, mm -hmm. which is a Dennis Wheatley story. Mm -hmm. um, and he he always puts there's always Christopher Lee playing uh, in some Dennis Wheatley because there's another movie called To the Devil a Daughter that Dennis Wheatley did the story to, um, and. Uh, Christopher Lee is in that and actually I dug up the fact that uh, Christopher Lee actually at one time worked in special operations mm. uh, now there was there was some you know who Christopher Lee is right or Christopher Lee that's yeah. right I like him. yeah there so there was some speculation that he was an assassin um, but I found a bunch of articles and he disputes that he says no 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 I, he says I, I, I was in uh, RAF special forces but I wasn't an assassin of course he's gonna say that if of course yeah. <laughs> um, but it is funny that he always plays those occult roles, uh, and he plays Duke de Richelieu in Devil Rides Out, which is he's like kind of this white magician that fights. Um, what is that guy's name? I can't remember the guy's name, but actually, uh, the whole point of this story is that the bad guy in Devil Rides Out is also based on Crowley. Right. Hmm. Crowley, hey, that guy's very influential between the Beatles and characters in movies and characters Mokata, in books. Mokata, that's his name. The, the bad guy in Devil Rides Out is called Mokata, and he runs this sex cult. Hmm. Um, and that's he's based on Crowley. Because Dennis Wheatley knew, knew uh, I, I think he did know Crowley, perhaps. Right. But that, I mean, now Crowley, now so L. Ron Hubbard created Scientology, rolled with him. Uh, Gerald Gardner started Wicca. Yeah, you have uh, JPL... Uh, Parsons, right, with Crowley. Uh, supposedly, I guess Crowley was influential in creating Beatles music. I think I read that somewhere. Was that in Dave McGowan's book? Well, I think I read that. I somewhere. don't know. Uh, I mean, he influenced the Beatles. Yeah, he uh, influenced them. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't say that he created Beatles music, but I thought but I read he somewhere was... that he actually wrote some of their songs. I don't. I mean, speculation probably, but I, oh, thought I don't. I, read I, that I haven't heard that. That's pretty interesting. I mean, like, it could be, but I haven't heard that. But since you brought up Devil Rides Out. Um, again, we were talking about, you know, the, the men that set up the, the OSS that later became the CIA, <clears throat> these were spies. And then you talk about the, 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 the convergence of spy craft with the occult, that there is a really big uh, crossover between the occult and the spy world, correct? Absolutely. Sure. Because I, I especially like when you say like Masonic lodges, they're good dens for, uh, spies right sure yeah trafficking and secrets so there's a natural relationship between those two and between the world of acting right because spies pretend to be what they're not right yeah argo Hold so absolutely that, right yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, exactly was, there's pl even plenty of like you said plenty of movies that even show us this yeah, yeah. Right. argo is a great example i mean argo's propaganda but it does show you that right right um twin peaks Honestly, mm. never watched one episode of it. I'm in. I'm interested in doing it just because I've read your analysis on it, and you know, you said recently. I think one of the creators uh, wrote a book that Mark confirmed Frost, yeah. every single thing that you wrote about Twin Peaks. That your analysis was 100% spot on. Correct. I essentially I don't have any reference to ask questions because I've never seen it, other than. The you know people always talk about the revelation of the method. Right. So how much of 
uh, Twin Peaks is a revelation of the method. All of it. It's 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 just as uh, I mean, if you enjoyed the esoteric aspect, I mean, in, in the sense of of understanding what's going on, and that's what I mean by enjoyed. If you if you enjoy Kubrick and what you see in Eyes Wide Shut, or you know the the conspiracy aspects of Kubrick, uh, Twin, David Lynch is a must because he's he's doing the same thing. I mean, he's just as important a esoteric filmmaker as Kubrick, easily. So he absolutely. probably reads a lot of occult stuff, right? To, to be able to put that into his. He films. does. In fact, I just today, yesterday was sent an interview uh, of all people between him and Russell Brand. Russell Brand just had David Lynch on, and um, oh, sure. ironically, I, oddly enough, the whole interview is about the Vedas. Mm. So he's talking about Vedic religion, Vedic philosophy. Um, in this like 30 minute interview with Russell Brand, um, I'm not endorsing it all, but I'm just saying it's interesting at right. least in the sense of, of another kind of confirmation of, of a lot of the analyses that I've done of, of Lynch films mm -hmm. uh, is confirmed in this in this interview where they're discussing you know esoteric Vedic philosophy. Mm -hmm. So anybody out there who has my intuitions were all correct basically, yeah. and uh, and now Mark Frost is is the co creator co writer. Okay. Uh, of 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 Twin Peaks and um and it was last year yeah sometime last year that he put out his because they were prepping for the return of season three of Twin Peaks mm -hmm. so he put out a book called The Secret History of Twin Peaks which is a fascinating book because it, it's almost like Dungeons and Dragons level lore for this fictional town that they created and they have all of this esoteric and Masonic philosophy. Uh, and that's why in part two, I included my analysis of season three of Twin Peaks because he, he and I included this, uh, the, the quote from the book, his book, where, where it confirms everything that I, that I'd said that you've got basically behind the American power structure is a kind of an occult power structure. Right. Uh, and I don't think anybody in 1991, 92, had any conception of that when they were watching Twin Peaks. They didn't understand what they were watching. It was so out there. It's so bizarre. And at the same time, it's satire. It's, it's making fun of soap operas. Um, it's doing, it's neo-noir. It's doing all these things on, on different levels. And it's also tapping into uh, a very pronounced esoteric philosophy. Mm -hmm. And you just don't see that very often. Right. Right. And it yeah. also touches on like, uh, sex trafficking and that, that kind of stuff too. Yeah, yeah. I, I again, I've I'm not seen it. I'm interested in seeing it just strictly because I read your analysis of it. It seems like something I'd very much get into. Have you seen any David Lynch movies? No, nah, no. Nah. I, I, oh, I wow. actually I might have and not even know because I don't really get into who's the creator and stuff like that. Um, I watch it and then just kind of move on. Um, well, I think with David Lynch is that he 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 the movies that he makes. I mean, there are predecessors. There are movies that influenced him, Ingmar Bergman and and Sunset Boulevard. But David Lynch movies are not like anybody else's movies. They're so weird. Uh, you will know once you do watch some, if you choose to. You will know from then on when you're watching a David Lynch movies because they're Lynchian. So. Right. Okay. Well, I like I said, I'm interested in it. Um, they're very and they're very revelatory. Very, very, very cool. Did, did, you, did you get that? So you read the chapter on Twin Peaks. Did you get the impression that it is revelatory? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why I asked the question. I mean, it's... Because, I mean, I've read um, Alice ba Bailey's Externalization of the Hierarchy, Red Changing Images of Man, and I think there's a conscious effort to sort of indoctrinate uh, the world into certain levels of the occult. Um, Theosophy. I mean, actually... Theosophy, uh, yeah. The, in, yeah, in, in season three of Twin Peaks, there are theosophical elements explicitly. Mm. In fact, I, I just remembered that I, in one of the footnotes, I cite an essay on theosophy in Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. So you're 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 on the right the right path there. Yeah, and, and again, when when I read, you know, the 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 white papers and such, it, you know, they they understand there's a crisis of you know the metaphysics, and I think that. They are consciously trying to create, like you said before, a replacement theology or replacement mm -hmm. metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And they want it to be based on Gnostic 
ID, you know, ideas, uh, Freemasonic ideas. Right. And so when they say revelation of the method, uh, as Bailey says, you know, eventually we got to reveal this to the to the to the masses. We're going to get to a point where we're almost completed. The next step is we have to show these people and get them to somehow accept it. And I think that's why these these things get, like you say, packaged in movies, especially in sci-fi. Um, I think that's why it's packaged in there. It's easy to consume it. It's easy to just accept it as, oh, that's just the way it is. Um, yeah. Your conclusion of the book, um, the marriage between Hollywood, CIA, the occult, mafia, sex trafficking, mind control, the whole thing. Do you think that some of these big time actresses and actors that do these types of movies, some of them have an idea of what they're doing, but do you think there's like the casting couch to sort of get blackmail on them to sort of get them to do these things and, and keep quiet about it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the casting couch has been known forever, but, um, I think all manner, anything that you could think of goes on. Um, some some A-listers work for intelligence agencies. Some of them are high-class prostitutes. Um, absolutely. Um, some of them are probably involved in blackmailing other people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, everything, check all the boxes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. And there have been plenty of, I'm not just saying that, I mean, there have been plenty of cases that come out where we, we do see this kind of stuff going on. Um, I mean, again, just think of the Nexium cult. Even though that wasn't really A-listers, you have high, high, you know, billionaire uh, families, you've got top political operatives, uh, and you've got this corporate world of, the, of these, this Amway pyramid type scam connected to, you know, one of the top TV shows of the... 2000s Smallville. Whatever. I didn't watch Smallville because so I don't really know when it was it was on. But uh, I was, she's not an A-lister, but she was you know a pretty famous TV actress. Right, right. Uh, all tied into this cult. And then one of the famous royalty, Catherine Oxenberg, her daughter was in the Nexium cult. She had to get her out. Mm -hmm. She's a famous British, I think British, British royal, um, British noble family. Um, so it touches that all over that top tier sphere mm -hmm. of. The one percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's it for the first book. Do you have um, anything you want to? Well, I was about just going to say that sometimes book? I include. Uh, it might seem strange, why? It's like in that last chapter, I include uh, a little bit of discussion of L.A. Confidential and Black Dahlia, and a lot of people didn't think Black Dahlia was that good of a movie, but. Um, my choices in the films weren't always just on the basis of obviously critical acclaim. Mm -hmm. um, some of the movies were, I, even at times, <clears throat> I include B movies in my analyses. Uh, part two has a couple B movies. You could argue, I guess, that uh, Legend is almost a B movie. Uh, I love that movie. I mean, it did have a theatrical release, but it was kind of, you know, wasn't the highest production value and whatnot. But uh, yeah. um, although Tim Curry's Devil was. A lot of production value but oh, such great makeup on that too his character was it is exactly yeah actually you know as i looked i'm not sure maybe i don't really in part one i don't actually think i have any literal b movies um there's a couple in part two just to kind of make it a little more lighthearted, but um yeah you want to give but, us but, a but, but you, you do two? you do want to check out black dahlia because black dahlia is one of the famous ritual murder cases in hollywood Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of theories on that. Most people think it was George Hodel, um, but I, but I included the discussion of that in that last chapter just to point out that the the beginning chapter was Hollywood Babylon. The closing chapter just reminds you mm -hmm. of that there is this this deeper, darker side to Hollywood that's not just a cult. It's not just intelligence agencies. It's not just you know powerful financiers. It's all of the above. Definitely. Um, yeah, so do you want to preview part two? Let us know what part two is about? Yeah, it's, and you don't have a copy of it yet? I not yet, no. Okay, that's fine. Because I, I was going to ask you if, if you had it with you and wanted to talk about. So what I did in part two was I um, organized it in sections like part one, but what I did was I, I went concentric circles from most rational to a little crazy to okay. pretty crazy to crazy crazy. So it gets wilder and wilder as you read through. Um, everybody so far thinks part two is better. They, they think I did a better, it's better written. Um, it's more entertaining. There's more funny parts. 
But I start with Hollywood mobs, cults, spies, and the occult. So I talk about the Aviator, Godfather trilogy, Hollywood dialectics. Um, even some comedies come up that you might not expect, like Clue from the 80s. Love Clue. Another Tim Curry. Yep. Clue is actually about the Cold War. And I didn't realize that until I went back and watched. After I'd read Quigley and all that stuff, and I went back and watched Clue, it, it made a lot more sense. <laughs> Um, there's silly stuff in here like Point Break, uh, and I included Point Break just because it's actually kind of FBI propaganda. Right. Uh, you don't think about it, but but it is. I'm talking about the one with Keanu Reeves and yeah, yeah, was, yeah, I'm not talking about the one. shitty remake, yeah. right? <laughs> um, v for Vendetta had to put that one in there. That's all Something about dialectics. Uh, the famous British series The Prisoner. That's also one of the most predictive programming heavy series of all time, and it's only 17 episodes, one season with Patrick McGowan, uh, The Prisoner. Have you seen The Prisoner? I'm not. It's you, another you thing. On, it's that. on my list, trying to find. Uh, and I'm, I'm really proud of my essay on The Prisoner. I think it's a really good essay. Um, Polanski's Ninth Gate, super occultic. Love that movie. Esoteric yeah. movie. movie. Uh, Twin Peaks, Fire Walk With Me, the movie, Twin Peaks, and season three is a chapter. Uh, I go into a lot of depth there. Uh, Back to the Future trilogy, Goonies, Ghostbusters, Poltergeist, and Stranger Things, and Time Bandits. So I wanted to hit more of those fun 80s movies that we all grew up with, like I, I did in the first one. You know, I did Legend, and I did Labyrinth, but I wanted to do, and Never Ending Story. Um, but I also wanted to do Goonies, Ghostbusters, Poltergeist, Stranger Things, Time Bandits, because those were those were big ones. And I had not yet touched any Terry Gilliam movies. Terry Gilliam movies are all about predictive programming and dystopias. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I felt like, man, how can I do a whole book? And I haven't even touched Terry Gilliam. No. So then we move. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I'll let you finish. Well, he, if you're not familiar, he did, uh, you know, 12 monkeys, which is one of my favorite movies. It's a great one with Bruce Willis, um, predictive, um, dystopian movie. Right. Uh, he did Brazil. He did, uh, imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, Heath Ledger's last yeah. movie before he dies. And Heath Ledger is actually ritually murdered in the movie, which is very strange. Sad. Yeah. Um, I just actually rewatched Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus because we're going to do, um, I'm about to hit 40,000 subscribers, so we're going nice. to do a Terry Gilliam party for 40,000 subs. Awesome. Um, so we'll be doing 12 Monkeys, Brazil, and uh, what did I just say? Imaginarium. Right, yeah. um, Stranger Things, I had to include that one in there. It's all about mind control. Um, and even though it's not an 80s movie, it's playing on all those 80s tropes yeah then in section two we moved to hollywood mind control and and my original intention was to touch on all of the hollywood mind control movies and then i realized there's no way i could fit them in the book too many so i had to, yeah i had to make a selection i did a chapter chapter just on lsd in hollywood a chapter on clockwork orange they live lost boys american ultra the cell which is an overlooked movie with uh jennifer lopez and vince vaughn mm -hmm. and neon demon and then in section three, we do Hollywood weather control and aliens. So I go back to aliens, how aliens are part of psychological warfare, movies that dealt with geoengineering, um, Avengers, Snowpiercer, Dune, David Lynch's Dune. Uh, and then we move to and uh, Shyamalan Signs, by the way, which is not about weather control, but it's another alien type movie. And then in section four, we move to Hollywood transhumanism. So it goes to the craziest and I talk about NGOs, I talk about transhumanism, I talk about ideologies being weaponized. Mm -hmm. And the movies I chose were Tron, The Matrix, Running Man, Terminator Series, Her, Ex Machina, Westworld, Cherry 2000, which is a great B movie. And I closed the book with Metropolis. It's a lot of, how many chapters is that total? It's a little more. This one is actually 36 chapters. Jeez, that's, that's a lot of movies. It's still under. It's it's three. This one is a little longer. It's uh, three hundred and ninety six pages. Okay. So it's still under four hundred. Goonies, one of my favorite movies growing up as a kid. A lot of people are like, "How is there anything conspiratorial mm -hmm. in Goonies?" And you pointed out something. Uh, I've heard you talk about this before. You, give, give people a little sneak peek of why yeah. Goonies is in, in this list. Well, it takes place in Astoria, and this gets into uh, a very famous, rich, wealthy family, and the Eastern Seaboard or the that Seaboard elite. Um, let me see. I'm trying to pull it up, and it gets into 
skull and bones. It gets into the Jolly Roger, the the symbolism and meaning of the skull and bones, the Jolly Roger. Um, Astoria is named after the Astors, mm -hmm. a famous bloodline. They come up in um, Tragedy and Hope. Right. Yeah. Section 2, Tragedy and Hope. Correct. Astors, and, 400. And so um, I don't think that's accidental. I think it's there for a reason. And I also noticed that there's something interesting going on with uh, Goonies in terms of FDR, the, the role of FDR, um, and what's called a Rube Goldberg machine. You know what a Rube mm -hmm. Goldberg Yeah. Uh, I actually kind of think the whole movie is kind of this sequence of events, a chain of events, like a Rube Goldberg machine. Mm -hmm. um, and I caught that the last time I watched it when everybody's familiar with the, kind of the, the trap door that they've arranged when, um, who's the fat kid? When he comes to the, to the yeah, when Chunk. Chunk comes to the house and there's this weird, goofy Rube Goldberg yeah. machine to open up the gate. I started realizing that actually the whole movie functions that way. Yeah. The, bo the booby traps are all that way. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you can debate that. I, I might be wrong about that, but it, it caught my attention. And I think that um, there's something to that. Right. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in, uh, in Goonies that I think a lot of people overlooked. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. Um, I'm gonna have to watch it one more time now. I haven't watched it since I read the uh, uh, or listened did, to. Did you grow up watching it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was one of my favorite movies growing up. Yeah, me too. The um, and then they live. Is that one of your B movies? That wasn't a blockbuster, right? It wasn't. I guess technically, it's a. I think it had a theatrical release, and it did. Really? I mean, it did have a low production value, but um, you. I guess you could debate whether they live as a B movie, probably roughly. But yeah, I, I think. I mean, they live is is actually one of the ultimate conspiracy movies. Yes. I, I felt like it was just absurd not to have it. Now, actually, when I spoke in Texas a couple of years ago, and I did my talk on um, Hollywood propaganda. A lot of people in the audience were like, "Why didn't you do They Live? Where's They Live?" Yeah. So I had all these people bitching that I hadn't done They Live. So I finally got around to it. Wrote like a I don't know, fifteen twenty page super analysis of They Live. Um, came out really good. And uh, oh, I forgot to mention the movies that I did under the. Did I mention the cult occult movies? Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. Um, actually, Lost Boys. Yeah, so Lost yeah. Boys is a mind control occult movie too. Um, but yeah, they live is great. I mean, John Carpenter was was, you know, very foresightful in that in that movie. Yeah, you've done. I think when you did uh, Annie Jacobson's book, you also covered John Carpenter's other stuff, The Escape from Escape from New, New York. York. Yeah, New York. Yeah, and I also yes. did a live stream on the the thing too, which I think the thing is 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 worth checking out as well. Um, and yeah, Escape from New York actually has some really interesting predictive, like you said, these kind of DARPA surveillance. Mm -hmm. elements to it that were way ahead of their time definitely so um jay's analysis.com that's where you want to go jay has we have 1500 articles oh i don't know if it's that many i mean um that was probably around 11 1200 okay. Okay, and then yes. uh, you know in the, in the last in the last year i've gotten heavy on doing videos so i think now there's you know there's like 800 videos now or something like that yeah so not only do you have two books with these, but you also do 15 minute videos talking about the same thing you do in the books. You do some videos on your site as well as you have just some write ups as well. Things that maybe just didn't get into the book. Right. Uh, so if, if yeah, there's actually a whole nother books worth of essays. Yeah. Yeah. That so aren't in a book yet. So if, there, if, 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 if Esoteric Hollywood two sells good. Yeah. I mean, there'll, there'll be a part three because, my idea was just to do a trilogy, but mm -hmm. you know that'll just depend on how well part two sells. Mm -hmm. And so if anybody really enjoys movie analysis and you want to find your favorite movie of all time, I'm pretty sure Jay's done it. Um, you're about to do another TV show? Is that in the works you said? Yeah, we have one that's being shopped. So uh, we did a what's called a sizzle reel where you just do, you film like a five minute version of what the show will be and who's in it. And then they shop that around to... Mm -hmm. uh, the different channels and networks. And so I don't know it's being shopped. So, you know, we've heard that there was some interest, but that kind of stuff usually takes a long time. So yeah. 
There'll probably be months before we know anything for sure. Well, good luck on that. I hope that goes through. Thank you. Um, also, on your site, you cover theology. And by the way, this show yeah. would be different from Hollywood Dakota. Hollywood, I was, I'm very happy with Hollywood Dakota. I think it's a great show. Um, the episodes turned out yeah, as well. good or better than I expected. Yeah. But this will be different. This show, uh, um, I'm not, I can't say the name of it or anything like that, but it's not just movies. It's actually pop culture. Okay. So there'll be movies fashion, music, okay. nice. you know, TV show, all of it being discussed. Nice. Very nice. And um, for those who are into theology, you cover you have any lectures on theology, orthodox uh, theology, Correct. right? Yeah. You cover, my favorite of your section is your Globalist series. Thank you. Uh, I've watched every single one of them. I've uh, bought so many books based on your recommendation list. You have a recommendation Great. list of all the books that you read, you've covered, that'll help people. Well, not all the ones I've read, but. Not, okay. <laughs> oh, you well, no, the Globalism okay, not book all series. The but read. yeah, no, no. Uh, when my site got, uh, when I had some issues with the site, um, I had to restore the reading list. I've got most of the reading lists fixed um but all the links are broken so i have to fix all the links but but you can go and see all the recommended reading for sure right um and then philosophy you have right. a lot of articles on philosophy you have a lot of uh lectures, lectures on, on philosophy which i think your your strength between your 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 philosophy and your uh theology together um i you have some of the best apologetics i've ever read and i've ever Thank seen Awesome. Listen to. Um, so those who uh, want to get a better source of apologetics, Jay should be your source. He's one of the best. Cool, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to promote? No, just that if you do want to get copies of either part one or part two, uh, you can get them at my website because if you get them from Amazon, authors don't do very good from Amazon. So I offer signed copies. All the copies are signed. Um, so if you get them from me, it's a little bit more, uh, there you go. Right. <laughs> if you get them from me, it's a little bit more, but they're all signed. So, um, so get your signed copy there and I can assure you, like, like you said, if you enjoy the stuff that we've been talking about, my, my books are right up your alley and I'm really, uh, really happy with part two. I mean, I like part one, but I'm really happy with part two. Now that I've wrapped up part one a few weeks ago, when we've done this interview, I'll be placing my order for part two probably cool. immediately. Awesome. And uh, I can't wait to get into that one. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to uh, continue to enjoy your website. Thank uh, you. You do have a very small monthly uh, subscription. It's like four ninety five. Yeah, four ninety five a month or sixty dollars a year. Yeah. yeah. And then you get access to all the archives and all that. And then I do I do a lot of tutoring now too on Patreon. So if people want to. Schedule tutoring. They can go to the Patreon or just message me and set up tutoring sessions. Um, I have a question for you. So, sure. uh, like, so when you read part one, was what movie that I covered did you watch that kind of like that you that you saw in a totally new way, or was there one? Um, definitely Legend um, was one that. Um, cause I saw it as a goofy, fun movie and then you right. made it real dark. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, E.T., you cover, I didn't have many questions on E.T., um, but that was a fun, you know, uh, movie as a kid that mainly the ones you covered that I grew up with. Right. Um, that's, back, those usually are the ones that kind of freak people out yeah. <laughs> in a way. It's like, whoa, that's weird. I didn't know that was, um, let me see, Never Ending Story, another one I saw as a kid. Yeah. I would have never seen the stuff you talk about if you never brought this up. Um, Blade Runner, of course, one of my favorites. Uh, I went back and watched it again. And then when the new one came out, watched it considering everything that I read before. And the new one, I'm like, boom, I'm just picking this stuff up like immediately. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Jay pointed this out, Jay pointed this out. And the wife hates watching movies with me now. She's like, can you just watch the movie? I'm like, no, this this is going on. You got to pay attention here. Um, and the Bond stuff. Uh, I Again, I didn't watch any of the Sean Connery ones until you know I started reading your work. And I go back and watch it. I'm like, holy crap. And I, again, pointing all these things out. And the wife's like, we can't watch movies anymore. I'm done with you. So you've, you've, ruined, you've ruined movie night for me. <laughs> um... <laughs> have you uh on your site i've not seen no you say in part two you're doing the matrix right 
Uh, it, yes, I did do the Matrix. That's got to be probably your, one of your most requested too, isn't it? The Matrix. Uh, it was. I mean, uh, I wrote that analysis uh, maybe three or four years ago, and it actually went viral um, yeah. when I wrote it. I think it went. I don't. Even, I lost track of how many views it had gotten. Um, so actually, what I did when I put it in the book was I wrote more. I expanded it, rewrote it, kind of revised it, remastered it. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a little it's beefed up it's not the exact same one and i do talk about part two and part three mm -hmm. uh, which i didn't cover in the original essay but yes the matrix is in here and uh it turned out good if you saw the tv show uh, the episode that we did on the matrix for hollywood decoded uh it's a lot of the same type of material because when i wrote the when i wrote the notes for the t hollywood decoded show it was based on a lot of what i put in the book mm -hmm. yeah um, and I think you have a 15, 20 minute video breaking it down too. No, uh, not yet. Not yet. I, thought I, was, what, I did a live stream, um, but I need to actually go back and I'm going to do a uh, 15, 20 minute. I'm actually going to do a 15, 20 minute. My, my goal is to do a 15, 20 minute high quality type of video like I've been doing right. for all of them. Because the live streams are fun, but actually the YouTube won't promote the live stream like they will in the algorithm, uh, a 15, 20 minute high quality video. Mm -hmm. But um, again, you're like you were saying there, uh, you do offer tutor sessions. Correct. And I can um, uh, give you a ringing endorsement. We've had multiple talks on, I'm trying to get into philosophy. Philosophy. Get smarter. Nice. Uh, Jay has been a tremendous help. Cool. Um, help me understand uh, things on a much deeper level, question my own presuppositions, completely mm -hmm. help me uh, gain a little more consistency in my own worldview. So I thank you for that. And uh, bet, anybody man. else who wants that or geopolitics, theology, uh, movies, all those things, hit Jay up on his site, right. on Patreon. Um, and unless you have anything else, I'm going to let you go. We've been going for almost two hours. Uh, also, yeah, subscribe. Uh, for my, if, if you're watching this on the Jay's Analysis channel, be sure and subscribe to um, – what's your channel's name? I'll have it. I'll have a link below. But okay. It's a Jessam Guys podcast. Okay, so we're going to – I want to tell everybody to subscribe to his channel. And if you're watching this on his channel, subscribe to my channel. So I'm trying to grow my YouTube. We're almost yeah. at 40, 40K. I'm going to send all five of my viewers right to you. Right, right well, away. but you you <laughs> might have people watching this 10 years from now when you've got 100,000 subscribers or a million subscribers. We'll see, hopefully. Um, again, I very much appreciate your time. Thank you for doing this for me. Absolutely. Uh, hopefully I get to talk to you uh, maybe after I read part two, ask you some questions again about part two, have you on. Yeah, that'd um, be great. And then until the next time, I need to uh, have a, um, a tutor sesh. Okay. Uh, I'll talk to you later.